to please uh, switch on the camera and also uh, unmute themselves, starting with Dr. John Slocker, Dr. Saurabh Jain, Dr. Giovanni Morcon, and Dr. Dominic Tobe. Over to Dr. Dominic. Okay. Uh, on behalf of the, on behalf of the uh, European Society of uh, Strabology, I would like to thank the Board of uh, Delhi Ophthalmological uh, Society for the invitation. And uh, I will, uh, this is now John Sloper, who is going to talk to us about uh, how to avoid problems with sensory strabismus. John. On behalf of the Delhi Ophthalmological Society, I, Dr. Namrata Sharma, the, General, the Secretary of the US, would like to uh, thank you for accepting this. And uh, thank you so much for doing it. And uh, welcome, everybody. And Don, Dr. John Scopper for his talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, the problem I'm going to talk about is strabismus, which is secondary to a loss of visual function in the eye, loss of sensory input to the eye, that loss of sensory input causes a loss of fusion or diplopia if the quality of the vision is impaired and prevents fusion. And it may prevent visual function in one or both eyes. The common causes of this, working from the front of the eye to the back, are something like keratoconus or corneal opacity, unilateral cataract, if it's long lasting, can occur following retinal detachment with retinal distortion, uh, retinal dystrophies or other retinal diseases, optic nerve anomalies or injury, or loss of visual field in glaucoma and neurological disease, and can also occur with severe amblyopia. The principles of management, first of all, the first question to ask with a patient like this, is, is there any prospect of restoring vision in the affected eye? And secondly, and this is a separate question, is, is there any prospect of restoring binocular function in that eye? Because if you restore vision without restoring binocular function, there's a risk of double vision after surgery, and this could end up with the patient actually being worse than they were in the first place. A patient can function much better with good vision in one eye only, than with diplopia. And there are often multiple barriers to fusion. There may be problems with refraction. There may also be retinal anomalies. There may be changes in visual field as well. And there may be preceding amblyopia or other effects of deprivation. So adult sensory strabismus. So is there any prospect of restoring vision? First of all, is the question of inherently reversible? Anterior segment opacities are often treatable. Posterior segment lesions, much less amenable to treatment in general. And if there is an anterior segment opacity, you have to think what is the risk of there being unseen posterior segment damage and take account of that. So the first question is on the history. What happened? Uh, how was the visual loss in, incurred? And particularly, how long has the vision in that eye been lost? Examination can show signs of damage from injury. It can show pupil changes. And projection of light is very useful. If you shine a torch through a cataract in the four different quadrants, and the patient can't accurately localise that uh, light, there is likely to be posterior segment damage. Ultrasound can also be useful, as can electrophysiology mainly in the form of flash VEPs, as pattern stimulation won't work through an opacity. But the commonest ways of restoring anterior segment vision are cataract surgery or with a corneal opacity, corneal grafting. And the question of whether they will fuse is important. And if they don't fuse, is it likely they will suppress or ignore the second image? <clears throat> Considerations here are the likely acuity following surgery and distortion of the image from asymmetric astigmatism uh, and isoconia, different image sizes in the two eyes and associated retinal problems. Uh, you can make refractive adjustments to assist, assist fusion. 
if there's asymmetric astigmatism, you can omit the, the cylindrical correction in the less well-seeing eye and just use a spherical equivalent. And that will minimize the difference between the eyes and can sometimes allow fusion that wasn't otherwise possible. For an isoconia, you can use a spectacle lens to correct the image size difference and cancel the refractive effect of that with a contact lens. So the spectacle lens and the contact lens are the same power, but they have an effect on correcting an isoconia. We also need to consider whether there are changes in the central visual pathways. And this will depend on the duration of visual loss, particularly duration of divergent, as these patients often go divergent with a poor vision, the nature of the visual loss, and also the age of the patient. Orthoptic examination can be useful if they have correctable vision in the eye. You can do post-operative post diplopia testing with prisms, provided that it's simply a, 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 an aphagic eye with potentially good vision. The human Wilshofsky phenomenon is very useful. If the poorly seeing eye bobs up and down spontaneously, the chance of fusion after surgery are minimal. And in a, in a patient without a lens, refractive correction and alignment with bot botulinum toxin can tell you whether they've got potential for fusion in that situation. Right, we all know that cataracts in children cause central effects, but so do cataracts, long-standing cataracts in adults. This is the patient in his 40s with a dense long-standing cataract in his left eye. And secondly to this, the left eye has become divergent. Uh, we did a study a number of years ago where we looked at 11 patients with long-standing dense unilateral cataracts with documented onset in adulthood. And they were all present for at least a year or else the eye was divergent. Uh, they had cataract surgery and they were all six, nine or better in the operated eye the day after cataract surgery. Nine of these patients fused straight away and had no problems. One had diplopia, which recovered and fused after a week or two, and one patient remained divergent with diplopia. And we looked at visual evoked responses in these patients. There was a mean VEP delay from the affected eye of nearly 10 milliseconds, which resolved over about three months. Eight of the patients, we did eight control patients with early cataracts and they showed known delay. The two patients with persistent diplopia had long delays of 29 and 16 milliseconds respectively. So this shows VEPs from the patient that recovered. Here there's a delayed VEP in the operated eye, which recovered, they were improved by two weeks and had recovered by four months, by which time he was fine. This other patient um, had pattern reversal BPs four days, four months and six months following the removal of a dense unilateral adult onset cataract. This would be known to be present for 18 years because he'd been injured in the eye. It was actually in Belfast. It was hit in the eye by a rubber bullet and had a cataract at that time, but it wasn't treated for 18 years. He was divergent before surgery and remained divergent after surgery, even though he corrected a 6.5 on day one with a contact lens. Um, and here you can see he's got a big VEP delay on day five after surgery, still a delay day 11, and still six months after secondary IOL, even though at this stage he'd been tested with a contact lens, been given botulinum toxin and had fused, and was able to maintain fusion with the secondary IOL there was still at some delay in that eye, although it had improved. And this shows a control patient uh, with no delay after her cataract surgery for an early cataract. So adults do suffer from visual deprivation. It doesn't affect acuity in the eye, but it can affect their ability to fuse. Um, in monocular, I think it can be a particular problem. Um, Arif Khan, did a study of secondary IOL implantation up to 20 years after uncorrected ophakia, and he produced suppression rather than fusion in most patients. We also did a study of keratoconus, um, and this showed that patients with severe unilateral keratoconus also get severe delay and problems with fusion. 
And these are patients with at least five years of uh, problems with keratoconus. Now, the biggest problem is intractable diplopia, and this is what you want to avoid. It can either occur because of loss of suppression in an adult with a childhood squint, or because of what's called horror fusionis. So there is no fusion when the eyes are aligned with toxin or surgery. And this may be either due to changes in central visual pathways of the type that I've described after long-standing cataract surgery, or loss of fusion from damage to brainstem motor centers. Um, patients with intractable diplopia also have VP delays in the affected eye, so this appears to be the reason for the loss of fusion. You can also get diplopia loss of fusion from retinal changes, uh, loss of retinal function affecting acuity, contrast sensitivity even with good acuity, and retinal distortion or displacement. You need to know whether these patients have motor fusion with central retinal distortion or displacement, and some can be helped with prisms, but if the central area of the retina has moved into the relation to the periphery, they can be very difficult to treat. Patients with a lot of field loss from glaucoma can also have a lot of problems. And patients with neurological deficits, again, can fuse. So thank you very much indeed. I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you so much, sir, for finishing it in time. Uh, we would be having the questions right at the end if there are any. We have not received any questions as of now. Uh, can I request Dr. Saurabh Jain to please unmute himself and start the screen sharing as uh, he shall be talking next. Over to Dr. Saurabh Jain. You can get started. Thank you very much uh, for this kind invitation. It gives me great pleasure to be here. Uh, firstly, thanks to Issa for inviting me, and secondly, to Joss. And Delhi is a place where I did my, well, where I grew up and where I did my training. So it's a great honor to be to be back here, uh, even if virtually. I'm going to talk briefly about transposition surgeries in strabismus. Now, transposition is something that we use when we change a location of a muscle to change its vector force of action. And there are various uh, places where I use transposition in my clinical practice. But for this talk, in the interest of time, I'm going to talk specifically about the use of transposition in rectal muscle paresis or palsy. And within the, this group, again, we have a number of cases where a transposition might be effective in giving you a good surgical outcome. So I'm going to really concentrate the rest of this talk on six nerve palsy, but we have to take questions on the rest of them. Okay, so I'll start with the case of a 77 year old Caucasian man who came just with an eight month history of double vision uh, f following a, cere a, a cerebral venous accident. He's with hypertensive and diabetic, so he's a vasculopath, he's got normal vision in both eyes, and he has a right isotropia, which you see here increases in left case with limitation of right abduction. All the other investigations and examination were normal. So this gentleman appeared to have a classic vascular six nerve palsy that had not got better with time. I've got a video here that demonstrates this, and you can see this is eight months down the line now. He's got a right isotropia with very limited abduction of the right eye and increase in isotropia in right gaze. So here we do have to do something. Now, I have a very simple algorithm when it comes to signal palsy. If the LR function is present but reduced, a recess resect procedure can work quite well when you do an MR recession and adjustable and a large resection of the paretic muscle However, if there is no LR action, and you can find this out by two ways, by doing a force generation test, when you place, say, a cotton bud on the outer surface of the eye and ask the patient to look in that direction so you can feel the force on your cotton bud, or by using some toxin that you put in the medial rectus to see how much abduction you get. <laughs> if on both of these uh, maneuvers you find that there is no LR function, then I think a resection of this dead muscle is likely to fail in that case, you need a transposition procedure. Now, these are the transposition procedures we all know of. You can do a full tendon a movement of the SR and IR to the lateral rectus, or you can, you can divide the muscle. The reason we try and divide the muscle is to try and uh, spare the vessels to reduce the risk of anti-segment ischemia. And we'll talk on this later. But even in a Jensen's procedure where the vascular supply is theoretically left intact, there is a significant risk of, uh, of anti-segment ischemia. And there's something we really do want to avoid. This is a paper from India that looked at 400,000 surgeries. 
And yes, incidence of anticyclin ischemia was quite minimal, but it is there if you do more than two extraocular muscles. And interestingly, they said the limbal incisions are predisposed to more severe ischemia, probably because they involve the anti epistolar arterial circle. So what else can we do? This is an excellent uh, abstract from the Arvo meeting by Crouch and Crouch, when they looked at just transposing just one muscle. So they transposed the, the superior rectus laterally in patients with um, an isotropic Duane syndrome, which is just a congenital sixth nerve palsy. And they found that 95% of patients who had a superior rectus transposition with or without an MR recession had an improvement in the isotropia to go to less than 10% diopter, which is a very good outcome. And they found that in all these patients, the abduction was in, improved by 15 to 45 degrees. But much more surprisingly, they had no hypo or hypertropia, which is what you would expect when you are weakening or moving the superior rectus. Interestingly, when they did the same thing with the, with the inferior rectus, they found that um, two of the three patients developed a hypotropia. Now, I appreciate this is a very small group. This is another paper by Linda Dagi and David Hunter's group from America, um, written by Reshma Mandale. And this really illustrates the crouch technique very nicely. So you do an MR recession and on an adjustable, and then you move just the superior rectus to the lateral rectus, and you put in a posterior fixation suture. And I find this, this procedure works very well indeed. And this is what I used for our patient. This is one of their patients. They, uh, they illustrate a child with a left head turn, uh, you can see in the, in the top frame, and then much better after doing a transposition procedure. Now, what about doing an inferior rectus? This is a, 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 uh, this is a paper by Fred Federico and Stacy Pinellas from, um, from LA. And they looked at just doing the inferior rectus transposition, and they found that as Crouch had described previously, yes, an infer, inferior rectus transposition does give rise to a hypotropia, and also uh, an excyclotropia, but then you could utilize this in people who had a preoperative hypotropia or in torsion. So IR transposition does have a role, but you have to choose your patients carefully. So for this patient that I talked about, I used just a crouch procedure. I transfer the superior rectus to the lateral rectus with a posterior fixation suture. And you can see this is him two weeks post-op. He in fact has a tiny exophoria now, but he's, he's very well controlled in primary gaze and he has much improved abduction. So it's something that can really uh, be very, very useful when used in the, in the right, uh, right situation. Okay, now I was going to show you a, a paper by Giovanni Macron, who's one of my co-panelists, I just could not find it, who has, and I hope you'll talk a little bit about this, about you can, you can loop the SR and the IR together by using a suture if you, do, if you don't want to transpose the muscle at all, and that actually works quite well as well. This is the paper, I did find that um, uses a silicone belt to do that. That's a, a, another thing you could do. Another option is to split the muscle and to, um, and to move them lengthways. This is by Nishida, in which the uh, IR and SR were split in half lengthways, and that should the sclater adjacent to the lateral rectus. And they got a lot of correction. They got a 40 out of correction per eye without a tenotomy. There was a, uh, there was a, a simplification and a um, modification of this technique, uh, which you see here. And what they did here was they, they did felt they don't need to split the muscle at all. So they put in a suture, 10 millimeter behind the SR, 10 millimeter behind the limbus towards the LR. Uh, you know, it works really well. All you're doing is you're moving the muscles laterally to improve the abduction. They found this was very surgically simple technique. It was very atraumatic. You could choose where you put the stitches so you can avoid ciliary vessels and thereby you uh, keep the blood supply intact. And they found that even without an MR recession, got about 30% diopters of correction. If you added an MR recession, we got to get up to 60. So something to consider as a very simple atraumatic procedure to improve abduction in six nerve palsy. So in conclusion, a muscle transposition can be used successfully even if you have no LR function. If you're considering transposition of two or more recti, be aware of the risk of anti-segment ischemia. And SR transposition works really well with an augmentation suture. If you are considering using an inferior rectus, make sure your patient either has a hypertropia or in torsion, so that you can correct all of these things at one go. Think of Nishida technique as an atraumatic alternative to this. Thank you again for your kind attention.
Right, thank you very much, Sarab. Uh, our next speaker is Giovanni Marcon from Italy, who's going to talk about MRI in adult strabismus. Giovanni, over to you. Yes, thank you, John. I will now go to... <clears throat> Here you are. So, uh, good afternoon, and, and I have no financial interest in this topic. I would like to spend the first part of my uh, topic talking about the fact that MRI in adult strabismus is, is not a standard technique. And you need to know that you have to adapt, uh, probably also your machine, and you need to know that you have to, to train the radiologist and the, radio the, the, the radiographer on how to perform the technique. Here, for example, you see my solution. This is our head coil in our MRI machine. And we have built this device in order to have the patient fixate during the examination. You want the patient to look to the right, the left, or up and down, depending on which muscle you are looking for. So we have, we have planned to use some uh, colored dots, uh, yellow, or you can ask the patient, look at the yellow dot or the blue dot. This is because mainly we have some patients, mainly, for example, highly myopic patients that have low vision. And for them, it's much more easier to fixate uh, do, uh, color dot than numbers of letters. This is, for example, the, the workstation of the radiographer, which is very important to train them correctly. They, they can see the patient, they see the image here, they see their color dot that the patient is seeing as well. So he can see, he can tell the patient, look at the yellow dot and on the right, and he can check on the image if the patient is really looking to, towards the right, is he really contracting the muscle you want to contract. Another thing which is very important to know that we have two main protocols that may be used to image extraocular muscles. One is the so-called monocular and the second is the binocular. The monocular is the historical one and uh, you need to, to rotate the eye 26 degrees, 25, 26 degrees and you want to image separately the right orbit and the left orbit to image the muscles correctly or this was done historically rotating the head of the patient, but this is not a comfortable position at all, even because the exam may take some time. So <clears throat> now what you, you can do is to use the quasi-coronal plane tilting the MRI machine. So the patient is comfortably laying on, uh, on the back with the head straight, and you can tilt the machine, the MRI machine to obtain a quasi-coronal plane again, um, imaging uh, correctly and perpendicularly the muscles. Why this? Because the images may be quite different. You can see here, this is an image taken with the coronal plane, with the head straight, and this is the quasi-coronal plane. You can see quite well with, in the medial rectus is, is similar, but the image of the lateral rectus are quite different. And here in the coronal uh, uh, protocol, the, the lateral rectus is quite indistinct and, and foggy. So, uh, in the, when you have your, your protocol, you need to image the affected eye first in the primary position, then in the, in the secondary position, then you, you image the contralateral eye. And the process takes quite a, quite a bit of time, like 40 minutes. This is why it is very important for the strabismologist to ask the radiologist which muscles and which diagnosis you are suspecting, because you cannot image all the muscles in the same, in the same uh, um, uh, MRI, it will take too much time. You have to ask, for example, for you need, you suspect a myopic isotropia, you suspect a fondal palsy, you suspect a sagging eye, and so forth. These are all the, 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 the characteristics that you can find with the monocular uh, protocol in MRI. And here are some images. You may find the orbital asymmetry, you may note a like cyclic torsion of the orbit, you may measure the contractility of a muscle uh, in primary and during duction. You may measure very precisely in post-processing the delocalization angle between the superior and the lateral rectus. You may measure the, the actual length of the eye and you may follow all the superior oblique muscle belly and tendon uh, to note for, for uh, transaction for uh, anomaly of the muscles. Then after having imaged the, the, the muscle, usually you take some images of the trunk in the, in the monocular protocol. This is done mainly to follow the path and symmetry of the ocular motor nerves to see if there are some mass like in this patient here, or if there are signal alteration in the pons and the mesencephalon. 
And then the binocular MRI, which is the, with the patients and the, the head patients straight, is, is the uh, indication for the thyroid orbitopathy, and mainly where you use also the, the, the gadolinium as a contrast, and you mainly want to see uh, with images without and, and with contrast if the patient is in the acute phase or in the chronic phase. So usually for normal strabismus, you use the monocular protocol and only for uh, the thyroid ophthalmopathy, you use the binocular protocol. Let's see some images. Uh, as you know, heavy eye syndrome is, has been historically one of the main indications for MRI in this type of patients. Uh, for example, one advantage of the MRI, like in these patients, uh, you can explain the hair that this is a binocular uh, pathology. All two uh, um, orbits are, are um, affected and you have to tell her that she will be operated both eyes if she wants to straight her eye. It's not, left eye is not enough to operate her. Or, and, and so you can also help, MRI may help you uh, together with the clinical data to clearly indicate when a Yokoyama procedure is indicated, like in this case, or may, when you may use like in the so-called intermediate case with high myopic uh, patients, but still young and with a, a very big isotropia, where you may still use horizontal surgery to realign with success the patient. So you merge the clinical data with the angle measured at the MRI. This is a limit angle, 124 degrees, and you may still use the horizontal surgery. Another very nice indication is the sagging eye. This is a really increasing pathology uh, in our elderly uh, people, we now we know that the, the, the band between lateral and superior rectus get, get uh, aged with time. We now may uh, more and more distinguish normal elderly people from the sagging eye people and from the high myopic uh, patients. In the sagging eye, you see that the, the lateral rectus eye is, is sagging towards uh, the inferior part. Other typical characteristic are that the lateral rectus muscle is longer than usual, and you have this bulge here where the red or R arrow point, which is called lateral rectus bowing, which is very typical of, of this condition, together with the sagging of the lateral rectus. And we are more and more seeing these patients and, and distinguish them from other neuro neurological uh, disease. Another very useful indication for the MRI, when you suspect a compartmentalized atrophy of the extraocular muscles, for example, the lateral rectus has two neuromuscular compartments and the compartmentalized, compartmentalized atrophy is correlated and you can correlate it with the clinical presentation. This is, for example, a total atrophy of the lateral rectus muscle where the uh, transposition technique is indicated and these are, for example, compartmentalized atrophy or the superior aspect of the, uh, of the lateral rectus. And again, another image here. Also, the uh, fourth palsy has a comp is compartmentalized, and we are now recognizing, for example, isotropic atrophy, where all the muscle is reduced from an anisotropic atrophy, where only one compartment is reduced of, of, of size. And of course, the, the compartmentalized atrophy is again correlated with the clinical presentation. You can also distinguish uh, with the MRI images from the true further palsy where the muscle is atrophic from the so-called strabismus sursu adductorius where the, uh, the clinical images are similar, but the MRI image images are completely uh, different. And in the fourth pause, you may have very different situation with oblique, oblique in the superior oblique from a partial fatty degeneration to a complete fatty degeneration to an absence of, of the superior oblique muscle. Another interesting uh, way to where MRI can help you is to recognize other collateral uh, um, oculomotor palsy where you suspect a thermal palsy in this patient, the post-traumatic. And when you do MRI, you also find a fourth nerve which sometimes may be difficult to recognize clinically in the pre-op uh, condition. And finally, uh, when you have recurrent strabismus, strabismus that recur despite multiple surgical operation, an MRI can help you in identifying some supernumerary muscle or clinical structure that may help to understand why this situation is going on in some patients. You may, have, may find the levator trochea muscles, you can see here also between the optic nerve and the superior oblique, you may find also some very strange structures that, like the retractor bulba in muscle, which is a very rare structures inside the muscle cone. So in conclusion, 
So nowadays, if you think about, and I fully agree with the sentence of Dr. Diemer, it's very difficult for a specialist surgeon to operate a patient without a pre-op imaging to clarify the surgical site anatomy. Ophthalmology has always been a, an exemption because we are able to see the, or, the ocular structure because the eye is transparent, but we cannot see muscle, pulleys, and intraorbital tissues if not with the MRI imaging. So MRI may help you in the high myopia and the sagging eye syndrome, muscular entrapping, in inflammation, in pulleys anomalies, in muscle atrophy, in scar tissue, and in lost on sleep muscles. So for me, MRI has now a pivotal role in the strabismological research, but also is an important tool in the diagnosis and on the surgical planning in many patients. Of course, it doesn't replace a solid diagnostic reasoning in strabismology. Thank you. Thank you so much for finishing it in time, sir. Uh, to get started with our next session, we have Dr. John Slopper coming in again. Uh, can I request Dr. John to please uh, switch on his screen sharing? Thank you. We can see the screen. Could you please unmute yourself also, sir? Yes. Right. First of all, I have a confession to make. I have never seen a case or course a case of anterior segment ischemia. Either this makes me totally unqualified to talk about it, or else it makes me an expert for having successfully avoided the problem. I leave it up to you to decide which. For many years, we had a large and very friendly ginger cat. He had a very important job in our household, which was to keep dragons out of the garden. And he did this very successfully for many, many years. He used to control the garden and stay on watch. And he had his cat food and had his wages and did very well and was totally successful for all that time. Um, and then sadly, we lost him. But even after he'd gone, we still had no dragons in the garden. Um, and anterior segment ischemia is rather like that. Lots of things are done to avoid anterior segment ischemia. There is some basis for them, which I'll go over. But much of the time, we, it's not going to happen anyway. And people uh, are, are doing things and saying, well, this is avoiding it, when it's a very rare occurrence. So first of all, to start with the anatomy. The blood supply to the front of the eye comes partly through the anterior ciliary arteries, two muscles in, th in the superior medial and inferior rectus, and one in the lateral rectus, and they join in the epistolar circle. And that's the reason why, in cases at risk, people prefer to do fornix incisions rather than limbal incisions and to leave this, uh, this intact. There is also collateral blood supply coming through the long and short ciliary arteries and coming within or below the sclera. And then there's a big, great arterial circle of the iris. So there is a collateral supply going through the sclera, which is not affected by muscle surgery. And the balance of these two supplies probably differs quite markedly in different people and will affect the risk of anterosegment ischemia. This is what it looks, at, looks like corneal edema and opacity, a very inflamed eye. <clears throat> and this was one by after surgery on both vertical recti, 20 years after surgery to both horizontal recti. I think one of the very few cases we've ever had at Moorfields. Uh, you can do anterior segment angiograms to look at the circulation. And this shows filling defects above and below in this patient, indicating problems with the superior and inferior rectus blood supply. ASI is graded from one to four in severity. Reduced iris perfusion can only be seen on angiography and is not clinically of any significance. Uh, pupil abnormalities can be seen, changes in contactility and, uh, and dilate, pupillary dilation. Uh, Post-op uveitis is grade three and corneal change is grade four. And it's only grades three and four 
which are clinically significant in the sense that they may require treatment. A lot of our guidelines came from a questionnaire study done by APOS members in 1986. They had 221 questionnaires and only 30 cases, giving instance of about one in 13,000. Uh, some of the patients were quite young, but there were only three children and all these children had other significant risk factors. And to my mind, there are the essential risk of antisegmental ischemia in children is nil. And I've never taken into account in doing surgery on children, and I have not infrequently moved three rectus muscles at the same time in children. The presenting signs, the most obvious one was you, common one was iritis, also corneal changes, pupil changes less seen less commonly, and hypotony and reduced vision, un uncommon in this study. The procedures found to cause this were predominantly transpositions, and noticeably both the Jensen and the Hommelsheim, which are supposed to be protective, produced cases as well as vertical full tendon transposition. Operating on two adjacent recti caused a few cases, and stage four muscle erector surgery a few. Uh, other causes were again rare. A treatment. Uh, 12 were treated with topical steroids, only one with systemic, uh, although three also had both topical and systemic, uh, and six of the cases described didn't require treatment. And the visual outcomes are interesting. Uh, there was, although occasional ones had reduced vision, most patients did not significantly lose vision. And in fact, there was no significant drop in vision between pre-op and, and post-op. So although people worry about causing visual loss, it is very rare long-term. There are recognized systemic risk factors. One is age, uh, systemic disorders affecting blood flow like hemoglobinopathies, homocysteinuria, leukemia, and larger small vessel disease like hypertension and diabetes. So very important to take a systemic history on these patients. The local risk factors can be orbital ocular disorders, thyroid eye disease, for example, anything that might affect blood flow and previous uveitis, and congenital anomalies, including absent rectus muscles, can be a risk factor. Previous surgery obviously is important, particularly to other rectus muscles. Uh, John Simon and co. Did, presented a study of 34 eyes where they did stage surgery to three or four rectus muscles allowing at least three months between the procedures. And there was only one case of stage three ASI with no visual loss in that series. So staging can be important. Uh, uh, Jane Arver and John Lee published a study of just using iris angiography and found that filling defects were common, but only two of these patients were, had clinical ASI. So a lot of patients will get temporary filling defects but if you don't look for them in angiography, you won't see them. Uh, also, there was a study from the States looking and comparing resection with plication, and iris filling defects were more, co more common in the patients with resection of erectus muscle, but there was no clinical ASI. So how significant this is and how strong an argument for doing plications, I'm not sure. Uh, Tibuel and Kikunya did a respective study of 87 patients having surgery on three rectus muscles and only recorded two cases of clinical ASI, but the mean age of these patients was young and younger than the APO study, and the majority had surgery for the elevation deficit deficiency, so the superior rectus was left intact, and the blood supply from the superior and inferior rectus is more significant than that from the lateral recti. And so if one of the vertical recti is left intact, it is protective. So how do you minimize the risk of ASI? Well, the guidelines that I've always worked to were first of all, don't move three rectus muscles at one operation and leave at least three months before moving a third rectus muscle and preferably longer if you can. Um, and this is in a patient with no other problems. And certainly, I say, following this, I've not had a case. Um, recognize high-risk patients by taking a good sy systemic history. 
and be more cautious in these patients. Surgical pre procedures to minimize the risk. Well, Jensen and Hummelsheim with media rectus recession are said to reduce the risk, but remember that vessels may be damaged further back in the rectus muscle, not just at the exertion. Uh, our procedure of choice at Morpheus was a toxin transposition, whereby the superior and lateral, a superior and inferior recti were had a full tendon width transposition and we injected box line toxin to the medial rectus, which left the blood, su blood supply unimpaired. And this worked very well, and you were able to go back three or six months later and recess the medial rectus if it became necessary. Uh, vessel, sur vessel sparing surgery is advocated by people. I assisted Peter Fells with several vessel sparing operations. It is very slow, very fiddly, uh, and is not guaranteed to be protected because it always doesn't um, spare the vessels. Blocation rather than resection, possibly, uh, although I'm not, it doesn't stop me doing resections. And also the most recent uh, innovation for six nerve palsy, chest transposing the superior rectus and, and the medial rectus is two adjacent recti, and that displays the inferior rectus. So in summary, clinically significant ASI is very rare and unpredictable. Minor ischemic effects are fairly common and reversible and severe visual loss is rare. So although our cat did a great job in keeping dragons out of the garden. Um, sorry, the risk of, of can probably minimize by avoiding detaching three rectus muscles at the same time, leave three muscles th three months before moving a third rectus, recognizing patients with risk factors, using vessel sparing surgery, and avoiding limbal incisions for vertical rectus surgery. And as I was saying, dragons may be fierce, but maybe they're not as fierce as we fear them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for finishing it on time. Uh, we have our last talk by Dominique, Dr. Do Dr. Dominique Tobin. Uh, Dr. Dominique, you can get started. And after that, we have a question, I believe, which is now addressed to Dr. Saurabh Jain. Uh, Dr. Saurabh, we could answer it after Dr. Dominique's talk. Uh, I would also request all the people to please uh, send us your questions. We would be happy to answer. We would have approximately five to seven minutes to answer these questions. Dr. Dominique Tobin, you can get started. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the invitation to uh, participate to this meeting. I'm going to uh, expose my approach to surgery of very large angle esotropias. I have uh, no conflict of interest. Very large esotropia means usually a deviation exceeding 50 prism diopters at distance fixation without any palsy and without any previous uh, strabismus surgery. They are quite rare in children where I found them in uh, only 5% of operated esotropia, and they are more frequent in adults with 25% of operated primary esotropias. Surgical pr uh, the surgical issue is that the usual tables of amount with bimuscular surgery don't mention this type of uh, deviation. Lots of papers have been published describing various types of surgery as uh, three muscle surgery, botulinum augmented by major recessions, strategy in two steps, and special procedures as medial rectus elongation or muscular transplantation, taking the resected piece of lateral rectus to uh, the insertion of medial rectus. And in, if you have to manage surgery of large esotropia, you have to know all these techniques and choose the one that seems more convenient to a specific case. My own approach always tries to search for the mechanism of the deviation. Why, why is there such a large deviation? And this helps to find the best treatment. Actually, esotropia may be related to an accumulative convergence excess, tonus convergence excess, or abnormal rest position in esotropia, or a combination of all these mechanisms. Examination under cycloplegia is mandatory and shows if there is an accommodative part in the azo deviation. If ever, strabismus should be rechecked once the full optic correction is worn on glasses. Then it is very difficult to clinically differentiate dystonia from abnormal rest position. We know that tonus has a trend to decrease with time, while the rest position becomes more and more abnormal in long-lasting strabismus. 
We also know that tonus disappears under general anesthesia. And that is uh, that in this situation, we can examine the rest position. By example, those two identical esotropias are totally different under anesthesia. One has disappeared and is really related only to tonus excess or dystonia, and the other one is unchanged and related to an abnormal rest position, then to muscle modification. And surgery should not be the same in those two cases. Anomalies of the rest position are related uh, with tight muscles and are logically treated by recess or resect surgery. But the dystonia is related with overactive but normal medial recti. This overaction may decrease this time, and this is probably one of the reasons of the frequency of consecutive exotropias. Few surgical techniques are proposed to treat overactive muscles, such as Faden operation or more recently, recess resect on the same muscle. By example, I published a very good results in a series of purely tonic exotropias, meaning disappearing totally under anesthesia, whatever the awakened angle, and treated with Faden operation only. This is my algorithm to treat large angle esotropias in children. The final decision is taken under general anesthesia. If esotropia decreases, I will generally use posterior fixation alone if the eyes are straight or in combination with medial recti recession if there is still an esodeviation. If the child is under age two years with a very large esotropia, I will use botulinum alone to start and if necessary, in a second step, perform surgery with bimedial recessions. Recently, recess resect on the same muscle has been proposed to treat convergence excesses at near, and I published a series comparing the efficiency of this technique to Faden operation in 80 cases of purely tonic esotropia. The results are similar uh, with over 80% post-operative microtropias. On the other end, when esotropia remains unchanged under anesthesia, situation that I did not find in children, it is the place to use augmented bimedial recessions or other techniques. I would personally choose three muscle surgery, possibly associated to botulinum, and maybe consider two-step surgery. We are currently publishing our long-term results with my surgical approach, approach of esotropia in children with 10 years follow-up. Very large esotropia are present in only 12 cases, or 7.5% of the series. Under anesthesia, we found a decreased angle in all cases. One third of them were even straight under anesthesia, despite the large awakened angle, and they were treated with posterior fixation only. The other cases had a combination of posterior fixation and medial recti recessions, as you can see on the right. Only four cases, or 30%, needed a second surgery, none for consecutive exotropia. Two cases were reoperated one year postoperatively for persisting exotropia, and two cases were reoperated more than six years postoperatively for recurrence of exotropia. Those results are encouraging regarding the low amount of recession with a very good efficiency. And what is interesting is the absence of consecutive exo that we also observe in the whole series. Now we'll talk of very large esotropia in adults. We'll have a look on the three aspects of the situation. Why is it a very large esotropia? What are the binocular consequences of surgery? And which surgical techniques are we going to choose? Non-previously operated adults have more frequently large esotropias. As they have a long-standing strabismus, muscles have time to retract, to shape to this old uh, deviation. This explains why the devi deviation is more related to muscle than in children. As always, first thing to do is to watch the refraction, especially in young uh, hyperop adults that don't wear anymore their uh, hyperopia correction that they had when, when they were young. If it is the case, re-examine them with the glasses. And at last, if esotropia seems too large, sometimes bizarre, don't hesitate to image the orbit. Children may neutralize, neutralize after surgery, but it is more difficult for adults, especially in large angles, and even amblyopia does not protect against the risk to have postoperative diplopia, usually transient. I like to practice, uh, to practice a short prism adaptation, but anyway, it is not much reliable over 40 prism diopters. 
Examination of isotropy under anesthesia seems essential to me. It acknowledges about the rest position of the eyes, and especially if one eye is more deviated than the other. Then you can practice duction tests to guide the procedure. False duction tests uh, are known, especially used in pulses and fibrosis, by example. We can see here a tight medial rectus, but without quantitative data. The conclusion is that the muscle is too tight and it, it must be operated. Works have been done to try to quantify this elongation, even if it is still imperfect. The method that I show you has been developed in France by André Roth and Alain Pechereau. It uses a caliper and a hook with a dynamometer tuned on 50 grams when you pull it full. You position the eye so that the corneal reflex is centered and place the zero of the caliper facing the reflex. Then you pull the muscle fully and measure where the muscle's insertion can go on the caliper. Here, the muscle doesn't reach the center and stops at minus three, meaning a tight muscle. And here, the muscle goes beyond the zero uh, to plus three, meaning a soft muscle. The normal values have been uh, published between minus and plus two millimeters. Duction tests give indication about the state of elasticity of the muscle and its implication in the possible rest position. Elongation measurements help to tune surgery of recessed resection. Tight muscle must be recessed, and personally, I follow exactly the lack of elongation. And I carefully tune the resections to the amount of elasticity of the muscle to avoid as much as possible unexpected over or under corrections. All the techniques that I list here may be used function of the experience of the surgeon, the prudent surgeon may choose an intentional two-step surgery in large angles. Personally, I like adjustable surgery to try to go as far as possible in one step. Note that posterior fixation must be used cautiously in adults because muscles are tight, this is one aspect, and also because adults are more sensible to the limitation of a deduction that may be sometimes observed. And this is my preferred practice in this large isotropia. The prism doesn't cover the whole deviation. Nevertheless, I try to correct the full deviation with a three muscle surgery uh, with adjustable suture. And in fact, the, pa the patient felt okay. Very large isotropia in high myops is known as trabismus fixus. Imaging has given a nice explanation of the mechanism of this peculiar strabismus with the extrusion of the posterior pole of the globe between superior and lateral rectus. Yokoyama explained the syndrome and proposed the technique answering perfectly to the mechanism known as the loop myopexy that I like to combine with an adjustable recession of the uh, medial rectus. In conclusion, very large non-paralytic esotropias are challenging. As always, trying to find the reason of the situations help to give an appropriate surgical uh, solution. In all cases, always treat first the accommodative part with full ametropia correction and always pay attention to examination under general anesthesia. In children, Excessive tonus vergens is frequently the reason, as observed under, under anesthesia, and posterior fixation or botulinum, combined or not with other techniques, seems logical and give good results. In adults, primary large esotropias are frequently complex cases related to muscle retraction. Adjustable sutures are useful, compl a useful complement to any type of expert surgery, but there is no shame to choose intentionally a careful two-step surgery in this particular situation. And thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Stay safe, and I hope we can meet soon in the real life. We believe we have one question, uh, Dr. Saurabh Jain, if you could address the same. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question, uh, Dr. Gotke. I think uh, maybe I'm not so brave, but you know, if you have an orthotropic Duane syndrome, I would stay well away from them surgically because you know, orthotropic Duane syndrome, people have a lot going for them. They have straight eyes in most directions of gaze, they have good binocularity, and, um, and they don't have a head posture. So, you know, you have to be very careful when you're upsetting this balance. So in an effort to improve abduction, you'll probably end up giving them either a, li a limitation of the binocular single vision or a primary gaze exotropia, which they did not have before. So I personally would not touch them with a barge pole. I mean, I don't know what the, what the panel thinks. 
I, I would agree very strongly with that. There are a lot of downsides to Sergi and Duane syndrome. And I probably operated on less than 5% of Duane's that I saw, I would guess. You have to think very carefully what you have to gain from it. And the patient really needs to um, be fully on board and have a real problem before you try and solve it. I had a girl of about 17 came to my clinic after surgery elsewhere and she had had a small head posture, had her medial rectus recessed. And this gave her a new, new double vision on the side. She has previously had double vision. And she came in and said, this surgeon has ruined my life. Yeah. Now, we were able to talk her down and explain what it was. And in fact, he'd got a very good result. He'd given her a, a bigger field of monocular single vision, but she hated it. And also the double vision in the area where they were not suppressing previously is much worse than the double vision on the side where they used to suppress them. I, we got one more question, I think it just popped up. Uh, this is again addressed to Dr. Saurabh Jain. Uh, I think this is by Dr. Pooja. So there is a question about uh, uh, the association of horizontal and vertical large strabismus and uh, what do you have to do about that? This is a nice question. Usually, uh, as I said, you may choose to do it in two steps and uh, you can uh, use the, uh, the procedure when you transpose, you, you do a recessed resection on the medial and lateral rectus, and you can transpose them vertically to, uh, to try to treat as much as possible the uh, vertical deviation in the same time without touching uh, uh, vertical rectus. The other thing is that if there is a, a retracted inferior rectus, by example, uh, if you do the transposition of the horizontal muscle, it won't work very well. So you have to do uh, maybe in two steps or maybe just recess the two tight muscles as the medial rectus and the inferior rectus and see what happens after that. But uh, uh, as for the graves of tunnelopathy uh, strabismus, sometimes a uh, uh, little act will have a great effect and you have to be cautious when you treat uh, um, the, uh, the horizontal and vertical deviation at the same time, because it may be uh, unexpectedly uh, too efficient or inefficient. So I think you have to be prudent and not do uh, things too, uh, too difficult. I hope I answered. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I was told during training was that you get more effect than you expect in a large squint and you have to do more than yeah. you would expect in a small squint. And these surgical tables are, are, are misleading. And this has been formally shown by Steve Archer in one of his APOS lectures, where he showed that the size of the squint had more influence on the outcome than actually the amount of surgery that, that you do. And I must say, my approach to very, these very big angle squints is to do a maximal recess resect on one eye, see how much you get. I have got 90 diopters out of doing two muscles, and then come back and do the other eye if necessary. I mean, can I just, uh, yes, sorry. I just wanted to say Dominic made a very good point that, you know, before operating on these patients, you have to assess for restriction because if there is a restriction, your approach completely changes. So therefore the FDT pre prior to surgery is a really important step and one that we should not overlook. All right, uh, I believe with that, we could conclude this session. I would like to thank the chairpersons and the speakers for finishing it in time and also giving us the answers to all the questions. I would also like to thank the delegates for being interactive and also sending us the questions. Thank you so much once again. Uh, for our next session, which is going to be starting at four o'clock, uh, we are just one minute ahead of time, which is a good thing. I would uh, take the opportunity and invite our chairpersons to please uh, unmute themselves and also switch on their camera, starting with uh, Dr. Subhash Derea, Dr. P.K. Pandey, Dr. Gopal Das, Dr. John Peter Sote, Dr. Brisen Goyat, Dr. Alejandro Ambresto and Dr. Rohit Saxena. We also have Dr. Ehud Isa, who's also joined us. Thank you so much. I request uh, the chairpersons to please uh, take it forward and invite our first speaker. Thank you very much for completing the session on time.
and uh, hello to everybody hello good morning so i will invite dr john peter to be speaking on botulinum toxin injection in acute comitant acquired isotropia our first 34 cases dr john thank you today and thank you for inviting me to share this with you let me see if i can share screen with you so i cannot see what you're seeing but hopefully you can see my screen now no it is not uh, it is not visible okay i'll try once more just a minute yeah thank you and now it is visible Okay, thanks for the invite to uh, invitation to participate in your uh, nice meeting in New Delhi. There is a sound. There is extra sound on the. Uh, on my... Can you unmute? Uh, can you unmute all other successful speaker? Now it is clear. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So thank you for inviting me to share these uh, experiences with you in um, your meeting in New Delhi. Thanks to the organizing committee, and uh, I would like to share our experience on Botox treatment for acute acquired comitant isotropia in children. And these are our first cases. And I have done this study together with my co-authors Claes Lundqvist, Michael Hofsley, and Tobias Torpedersen. My name is Jon Peter Sounder. I have a, a disclosure which is not relevant for this talk. So 30 years ago, uh, Alan Scott presented uh, his first results on uh, strabismus treatment by botulinum toxin, and it, he showed us that you could tr treat up to 40 prism diopters with an uh, injection with Botox. Four years ago, uh, the group in Boston with David Hunter showed us that if you have acute onset comitant isotropy in children. Botox may even be uh, better to control this than surgery, and with a less risk of um, of uh, exotropia on long and long hand. So I'd like to share a case with you. This is a seven-year-old boy, acute acquired comitant exotropia, no prior medical history, no prior ocular history, normal vision, and not very hyperopic. The neurology worker was normal. And we decided to try to do as the Boston group to give him Botox in both medial recti. Here he is just before surgery or before Botox. So we gave him five units of uh, botulinum toxin in both recti, uh, medial recti. And uh, before uh, the treatment, he had a 25 PD ET at, uh, in primary, it's six meters and a little bit larger at side gaze. So the day after uh, Botox injections, his uh, deviation was still, he was still ET, but he was a little bit lower. The third day, he, he changed to an esophoria at four, at a distance at near, and now he was able to fuse. So the eighth day after Botox to both eyes, he had now turned to a little exophoria, he is still able to uh, fuse this. And we followed him during the days, and we saw that at two weeks, he was now straight um, and uh, uh, had no problems at near distance, no lateral incompetence. And uh, this stayed on for three months. And um, we were waiting to see, will he uh, relapse into isotropy again? At seven months, he was still straight, and we saw him a few months ago, and he's still one and a year, one and a half year later, uh, completely fine. So we looked back, uh, last year we looked at our uh, first cases uh, with acute acquired comitant isotropy treated with botulinum toxin to see how, they, uh, how this worked out. We found um, 
24 boys and 13 girls in two year, this two-year time lab, aged 2 to 13 years. And their duration of strabismus varied from one month to 38 months at treatment. So the success, success rate of this uh, treatment was 67, uh, 76%. And um, eight of the children uh, did, not, uh, did not have parallel eyes after this treatment and needed surgery. And uh, half of the patients uh, regained stereopsis of, of 240 arcs a second or better. And the symptom, uh, and we, we believe that um, from our study that if you have a longer lasting isotropia, the risk or the, the chance of, of success with this treatment is lower if you wait uh, for, for too long. With one exception though, we were quite surprised about this seven year old girl, which had three years of strabismus uh, with isotropia 25 uh, prison doctors for near distance. We could not measure any stereopsis either with, uh, no, uh, also with prisms. We gave her Botox to both rectum uh, muscles and found that at six, uh, at full up, she had, uh, she was straight and it turned into EC4 and even had stereopsis. So when you inject Botox to the orbit, we know that the Botox, which is diluted into saline, might diffuse uh, other places also to the other muscles. And there is a risk of ptosis in children. Uh, the, if you do look at, make a literature search, it says usually 5% uh, will have ptosis. We found 15% of the children had ptosis. So this child, uh, the left photo is before uh, Botox, the, the right, picture after Botox and she had a slight ptosis. And usually this uh, ptosis resolves after three weeks. And none of them had a ptosis which was severe, so we had to, to patch them for this. So in conclusion, both aligned toxin injection to one or both, uh, to both medial rectal muscles and the anterior part is a safe, quick and cheap treatment of acute acquired uh, common isotropy in children. We, we usually do this in a very short anesthesia. And we believe the mechanism here is that if you have the child with ET, if we are able to get them into X XT, then the children with the fusion of potential will uh, be able to lock into ortho when they pass from XT to ET on the drift when the Botox uh, wins away. And we also found that if the isotropy recurs, normal surgery can be performed. Thank you. I can't see the time here. I'm sorry. Uh, is there any more time left? Yes, sir, yeah. we have approximately yeah. four minutes left. Okay, because I have one more thing I'd like to share with you, which is uh, also to strabismus surgery, but this is to safety. And we have, uh, this is a short teaser for the European strabismus meeting, which is in one week. We have a um, poster there, and i will just like to show you a little part of this. Uh, we have been working on a, a poster to increase safety in the in the operation room, and we have designed a whiteboard uh, screen, which we use in the operation room to put it on the wall, and we document all the findings on the patient in one um, poster, and we um, uh, put all the numbers up. This is a uh, one of the cases, X4 in a child. And uh, we document the findings, also the, 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 the prism cover test in six meters and near, and then also what interval do we need to, to go for. And then we uh, document the cyclotorsion and the force traction test, and then we can go for a plan in the end. And um, we, we've been working on this for several years now, and this is the, the fourth uh, 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 example of this. And especially in, in complicated cases, we find it very, very useful to have this, uh, this uh, whiteboard to be sure we know where we are during surgery. This is a complicated case with four muscle surgery and how, how, much, how many millimeters do we need to move this? And we put this um, on, the, on the wall and we can look through the surgery to see where we are going and, and we can actually put a mark and we check this muscle, this muscle, next muscle here. And uh, in, in complicated cases, this is, I saw you had a Duane case before. This is another Duane case where we make a Y split to reduce the, 
elevation and adduction. And in complicated cases, we like to discuss uh, together the surgeons, uh, what did we do before, what do we do, uh, need to do now. So we find this a useful tool to understand together what's going on and how can we help this patient. And uh, we made this uh, available for the European uh, Strabismus uh, Association meeting, which is next week, and that will be available at their homepage. Thank you. So uh, thank you for a nice presentation. Any questions? Any questions from the panel? Yes, hello. I'd like to ask uh, Young. How are you, Young? Um, what, what surgery do you prefer when you have to do surgery in this uh, on these children after botulinum botulinum injection was not successful? Yes, I'm sorry, my video does not run. I'll try to get that running. Sorry, my apology for this. Well, I'm sorry, I can't run, run the video. Well, we, for, for acute uh, competent acquired isotropia, we actually asked the, the, we asked the parents if they want to try another Botox round because we have a, had a couple of kids where we performed Botox again. And the, the, um, the isotropia was relieved by the second uh, Botox treatment. Um, but we usually, for, uh, for uncomplicated uh, AACE, we use, uh, if there's a near distance incompetence, we, we take that into account. But if it's competent, near and distance, then we usually do a, a two, two eye surgery for both medial recti and recess both medial recti. We can't hear you because your, your microphone is off. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, for a, it is a temporary measure. It is not a permanent measure because permanently you have to do the uh, surgery in this sort of patients. And uh, they, these injections, they have to be given recurrent. So if uh, there is any, uh, Dr. Bill, uh, Birson, uh, would you like to ask some question? Uh, please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, actually, I do not have any question for uh, Jan. Uh, it's very nice presentation, especially the uh, operation theater uh, system is very nice. Maybe we copy uh, for our hospital. It's very nice. Thank you for this idea. Uh, you're very welcome. It's, it's then the ESA meeting next weekend. You should look at it there. Okay. We have a poster for you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Uh, Birsan. She will be speaking on uh, retro equatorial myopathy types, indication, tips, and tricks. Okay. Dr. Birsan, all is yours. May I share? Yeah. The presentation? yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, I'd like yeah. to thank organization committee for their kind invitation. And my presentation is all about retroequatorial myopexy. My presentation flow is uh, include effect mechanism, indications, types of operations, brief explanation of the operations with figures, types and tricks, cases, studies, and if I have enough time, I, show, I try to show uh, operation videos. 
Retroequatorial myopexy was first introduced by Cooper's at 1974 and named as Faden operation. This operation may be found also by the name of posterior fixation suture in literature. By suturing the muscle behind the equator, the length of the movement arm of this lever system is decreased and more muscle forced in need for the movement. Uh, the limitation of the movement of the eye in the field of action uh, gets more effect. Also, the functional loss of the fibers located between insertion and the new fixation point due to stretch and elongation and myoplasmic description of the muscle fibers uh, are the reasons of the effect mechanisms. Second effect seen on the fellow eye. By increasing in dimension operated uh, muscle and its yoke in line with herring law, there will be increased movement in yoke muscle. Even though Falden operation is relatively difficult, uh, it has many indications like azotropia, nystagmus, dissociative vertical deviations, doing retraction syndrome, congenital azotropia, azotropia with azeantric fixation. When we talk about the types of Falden operation, I like to talk about two concepts. First, real, uh, real retroequatorial scleral myopexy, which are classical Falden operation, uh, central Falden operation, retroequatorial strapping, which Falden operation. Second group has changing tor uh, torque of globe as Falden, and I named them as Falden effect operation which are Scott operation, pulley posterior fixation, split rectus muscle recession. Uh, now I will try to tell about the technique of surgery. During the classical uh, father operation, one third of muscle with, on both sides of the muscle is fixed uh, to the sclera, uh, 12 to 14 millimeter back from their insertion. Uh, five to six uh, zero non-absorbable suture is used. If there is recession, is faden, the faden is placed the same uh, distance from the insertion. The eye must be turned to the opposite side excessively. There are risk of vortex vein damage and globe perforation in this uh, type of operation. Reinforced faden has similar rules with classical faden. Uh, but in this technique, it has uh, the first suture is one third muscle width and narrowed in a triangle style and passed through the muscle and sclera three times. It requires experience, uh, of course, more inclined to uh, complications, but it can have a stronger effect. Uh, central Faden operation, rather preferred in North America, scleral fixation is applied to one third with only the center of the muscle at the appropriate distance, like the classical Faden. Retroequatorial strapping, uh, non absorbable suture is passed through the sclera on both sides of the muscle and then tight on the muscle. In this way, the muscle is wrapped like a belt. Here, the suture does not pass through the muscle. A bridge faden, which we use largely in our clinic, uh, in this technique, non absorbable suture is passed 11 to 19 millimeter behind the insertion from both sides of the muscle to, uh, to the sclera. The muscle passed under the, this suture and the suture is tight on the muscle. In other words, the muscle is squeezed between the two rows of the suture and sclera. Uh, Scott operation, which also named as adjustable faden, includes resection and recession in same muscle. Resection is made as much as uh, the amount resected muscle. Easy to perform, but not reversible as the other forms. Why split recession by calculation has also Faden effects. During this operation, muscle is divided into two parts in the form of Y and 
The distances are calculated and recessed as described in the original article. Additional procedure is required over uh, 30 prism dioptry deviations. In pulley of posterior fixation suture, muscle is fixed to the pulley, not to the sclera as described by Clark. Non observable suture is used. A pulley located just behind the muscle disappearing area in the posterior septum and not uh, visible. The, uh, if uh, the revision needed, the turnaround of the operation is difficult. This slide shows the ideal operation set for uh, success. These three instruments uh, seen on the right uh, have specific importance for this operation. For success uh, results, there are some clues. These are, since our activation area is very deep, the white detachment spatula have a very important role to facilitate the operation and it's indispensable for the operation set. Even if anatomical structures guides us, we need specific father scale to correct distance. During passing the suture, smooth light pressure to the sclera provides us more visible space and ease of movement. We must be careful not to over tighten the suture for prevent ischemic atrophy in the muscles. And now I will show some cases. In this case has unilateral amblyopia and esotropia with a distance near disparity. Pre-op gaze photos and post of one muscle operation photos shown in the uh, slide. And this person has uh, seven to prime diaptery deviations. Her early post of gazes show us ortho position, which only two muscle surgeries. This lady also had unilateral large angle esotropia treated with one muscle surgery. And very large eso treated only two muscle procedures, pre-op and post-op uh, gazes uh, shown on the slide. Similar case uh, with similar surgery and successful results on this case. Uh, now I will show, uh, uh, here I will give two clinical study results uh, made in my clinic. First one about classical technique, patient's demographics and findings are seen on this slide. Short term and early long term results are shown in this slide. As you notice, there is a very large uh, isotropia previous operation and very a low or almost no isotropia after the operations. Second study is about bridge fathom. Demographics and results of near distance disparity cases are shown in these two tables. And as you notice, a uh, very high uh, iso deviation decreased uh, approximately four or two prism diopteries. And now I try to show uh, videos, but I don't think you have enough time. This is the uh, classical father operation. I try to show a small, you see, we pass both uh, sclera and uh, one third muscle and tight on the muscle in both sides. Okay. I jump to second one and you know we check our distance with two scales okay okay i jump to second one now we are watching fully posterior suture operation in lateral rectus i prefer this type of operation mostly in superior rectus and lateral rectus at which normal fathom procedure applications are difficult on these areas because of the close relationship with the obliques. You know, we couldn't see the pulleys, but we hold uh, with the uh, hook and we get together muscle 
and police with the Nabzar Baba's future. And I jump again, the last video. Uh, we, they are watching a, a short operation. Oh, I need to manage them. Okay. Uh, let me I get a little faster. Okay. And uh, this is the bridge fund operation. As you notice, the uh, suture put on the only the sclera, not to. Sometimes we need, you know, a, a small, smooth push with uh, uh, material and, you know, the open the area. We need the very difficult. Okay, I scale the distance and again put the second suture on the sclera and get a little further. And we uh, tight the sutures on the muscle, over the muscle, as you see. And I think I uh, complete my time. Thank you for your kind invitation and please stay healthy for all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Birson, for an excellent talk. Any questions to Dr. Birson? Any questions to Dr. Birson from the panel? Yes, I'd like to ask her. Uh, I understood, uh, am I correct, that you perform the rectus recession after doing the Faden operation? Is that right? Excuse me, I couldn't understand what, uh, what's the questions. What do you do first? Do you place the stitches for the posterior myopexy or, or do you recess the muscle? Okay, let me explain. Uh, in, my, uh, if I, uh, in my hand, I put first uh, father sutures and uh, without tightening and then recess the muscle. If it's the classical father, uh, when we put on the suture, I calculate according to the uh, recession amount. If I need to four millimeter recession, I put the suture on the uh, sclera uh, 13 millimeter behind of the insertion, but the uh, muscle uh, nine millimeters back uh, to the sutures. And then uh, perform the recession. And other, uh, after that, I uh, tighten the, uh, the sutures. In uh, uh, uh first I put the uh, suture, but not tighten that and recess the muscle and then tight the suture. But if I uh, teach my assistant, because uh, all our assistants can uh, do this operation, uh, first uh, I uh, put in the sutures and get a loosen the suture and then uh, recess the muscle uh, under the suture and then tighten. Or I uh, make uh, some uh, signs uh, the uh, correct uh, distance with uh, uh, blue dot and then uh, uh, put the suture for recession and get a little uh, uh, up to muscle, put two sutures, two sides, uh, that because there is the science, and then get the muscle under the first suture and then tight over that. Okay, thank you. It's easy. My uh, all assistants can do this uh, kind of uh, operations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Birson. Uh, then uh, what is the most common indication in your practice and uh, what is the success rate uh, in, your, in your cases? Actually, <laughs> our success rate is the, uh, almost 90% uh, or a little more maybe. Uh, but if we choose the correct uh, uh, patients, you know, we take uh, all uh, our patients, uh, uh, the uh, deviations amount uh, for the places. First in uh, accommodative object, with accommodative object, and then near uh, deviation, then uh, distant deviation in uh, six meter, and then very uh, distant uh, deviation, maybe uh, uh, they saw from the window, maybe, uh, kilometers. And uh, according to the results of this deviations amount, I choose the patients. 
uh, of course, uh, most of the patients is uh, distance near disparity and uh, very large exotropias. Uh, because uh, I thought the pardon operation or retroequatorial myopics is the uh, seventh uh, muscle of the uh, eye because when we put the uh, suture, it gets more effect. Thank you. And now I invite uh, Dr. Ernesto. He will be speaking on uh, trochlear pain causes and treatment. Dr. Ernesto, all is yours for the next 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Dr. Dedeya, for the kind invitation. I will share my screen. Okay. Okay, so um, first of all, I'd like to, to say I have no connection conflict regarding this presentation. And this is the case of a woman that motivated this talk. Uh, she had many, several, several visits to the ophthalmology department due to different kinds of pain. And uh, I have to say when she visited me for the first time, um, she, she was obviously a female patient. And her main complaint uh, was several months of left orbit tingling pain, sometimes turns to throbbing pain. It was not permanent, worse when looking up, absent when sleeping, and it got better sometimes with, uh, um, with non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. She had no diplopia. Um, she uh, had a myopic anisometropia with low vision on the left eye, and she had a fake IOL on the left, on the uh, right eye. And she had no prior history of strabismus. She was being evaluated for possible Marfan syndrome also. Her uh, visual acuity was 2020 uncorrected with a fake IOL on the right eye. She had counting fingers uh, on the left eye. She had very, very large eyeballs and her uh, ocular motility was the following you can see she had um, a limitation of elevation mostly in uh, abduction on the left eye she had like a heavy eye syndrome she underwent a neurologic evaluation and um, the neurologist other orbital and brain images that were not ready she was referred to me by the orbit specialist when she uh, noticed this for business. The, on the second visit, she highlighted the orbital pain and she brought the orbital imaging with her. Uh, her ophthalmic evaluation was almost the same. And um, when I was uh, dilating her pupils, I, I um, I'm sorry, I, uh, I observed the orbital imaging. As you can see here on the MRI, the left uh, rectus was descended, on, on, as you can see here and here. And you can see this particular image here. Uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, think about that at the moment. And while examining the orbital fundus with the scapins, uh, she had some myopic findings, usual myopic findings in large eyes like this. But while performing the, the, the exam, she said, the pain is right here. And she touched the area of the trochlear fossa. So I thought, oh, well, you have trochleitis. She was, she was really dealing with this pain for, for a long time. And so I will speak about trochleidemia. Trochleidemia is a spectrum, or a spectrum of conditions characterized by pain arising in the trochlear area and that may involve more of the following structures, like the trochlea, the superior oblique muscle, the superior oblique tendon, or the sheath, and the nociceptive nerves of that area, that is the supraorbitary and or the superior trochlear nerve. It's a clinical diagnosis that may have an inflammatory origin, that is with trochleitis, or may be non-inflammatory, that is called primary trochlear headache or could be a trochlear migraine. The inflammatory form may be associated with a secondary Brown syndrome also, and it has a prevalence of 12 in uh, 1,100 cases, patients. 
the causes may be neuropathic, that is, uh, that, that is hypothesis, but might be due to repeated trauma in this clear area. The supraorbitarian supratrochlear nerves um, elapse close to the trochlea and might, might be, may be irritated by a recurrent lesion. Uh, it was described this with a superior oblique myopenia. It also may be inflammatory with inflammation of the components of the trochlea itself. And when unilateral might be idiopathic, but if it's bilateral, we have to suspect some re rheumatologic condition like beset or, or some other diseases. And it also may be neuromuscular, but this is unusual. Let me see. Okay. Uh, the usual symptoms in trochlearemia are increased trochlear tenderness with increasing pain with a contraction and stretching of the superior leg muscle, and also when reading. The patients usually uh, present without edema or redness of the area, even when associated with inflammatory conditions. Pain is frequently intense with intermittent exacerbations and might be described as as retro or supraorbitary pain with irradiation towards the orbit and sometimes to the opposite side. Orbital mid imaging might be helpful in 20% in, in, you know, of patients, but they are also useful to disclose other causes of severe orbital pain. The differential diagnosis are orbital myositis that has particular uh, imaging uh, characteristics. Graves' disease, Graves is usually not painful, a periorbitary neuralgia, cavernous sinus syndrome, and other types of headache. In a large review of the reported cases, they found 181 patients with an average age of 43 years old. 83 of them were women, and the secondary Brown syndrome was present in about 10% of patients. The most frequently used treatment were local steroids in approximately half percent of, of the patients, um, and two injections in average were applied. The treatment for this condition must be tailored according to the intensity of the pain and the association with migraine. When the pain is mild, we can try uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. With moderate or intense pain, if, if it has migraine or a secondary brain syndrome, and or when non, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs are helpful, we have to, to try injecting, injecting steroids in the orbit. Usually, we use uh, dexamethasone with lidocaine and with a very, very um, very small needle. Symptoms when uh, steroids are applied usually get better within three to seven days, but many times we have to try another injection because sometimes they are not quite uh, useful. And going back to the case that motivated this talk, uh, I want to, to make some comments about the patients. She underwent two unsuccessful injections of steroids. Um, and as I consider trochlodynia was secondary to mechanical trauma associated with the heavy eye, because she always referred, I have more pain when looking up, and particularly when looking up, uh, when the eye was up in, in adduction. So I performed strabismus surgery. She also wanted some cosmetic uh, improvement. And I perform um, a three millimeters, three millimeters uh, left uh, lateral rectus recession with 10 millimeters elevation of the insertion. And I place also an inoperable stitch on the superior aspect of the muscle, 10 millimeters from the limbus, in order to rectify the abnormal part of that muscle. And I also perform a two millimeters inferior rectus recession because it was contracture and cross duction tests were positive. As you can see here, you, you can compare um, the, the elevate. There was an improvement. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't perfect, but there was some improvement in elevation. Um, the deep pattern improved, and um, she, was, she, she was happy with this. 
and the pain diminished, but it didn't disappear. So what are the messages to take home? We have to take time to question and listen to the patient if it's not clear what might be happening. Um, we have to take into account proteinemia when examining a patient with orbital pain. Consider imaging the orbits and the possible associations, particularly in bilateral cases. We have to try medical treatment before considering surgery and perform strabismus surgery if we suspect a mechanical trauma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Armisto. Uh, there is one question from the audience for you. Uh, do you get children into GA to inject them and to try traction test? This is a question from uh, one of the anonymous attendee. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know if the question uh, is... There is, is, there is one question in the chat box. There is one question in the chat box. Do you get children yeah, into I can GA? Read it. I can read it. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I don't usually do that, but I, I don't usually find children with this, with this affection, with this uh, disease. But yeah, they are really unusual cases, and there, there are not many reports of patients with trochlodenia or trochleitis. That's why I found it interesting to show this. Then there was another question uh, with the <laughs> relation to Dr. Birshan. Uh, uh, do you use, uh, you also use uh, Fadam's operation in your surgery? Uh, of course, uh, I don't. Uh, 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 the, uh, question uh, by someone is uh, uh, regarding other panelists uh, regarding use of. Pardon's operation, other than Dr. Bilson. Okay. Well, I, I, I usually perform it not only in, in committant uh, near, um, near far um, isotropia, but also the clinical isotropia. Uh, but I always, always perform the recession of the muscle first. I pre place the stitches of the non absorbable suture in order to calculate the amount of recession I will, I will do. But I never perform more than 3.5 millimeters of recession because you can get uh, real high exotropias, consecutive exotropias if you do this. Yes, I have a comment to that as well, uh, to the question on Faden sutures. We, we use the Faden sutures uh, also, and we, we like to combine them with adjustable sutures. So we put the, the anterior part of the muscle on the uh, adjustable suture, and then we put the Faden in, uh, which is not so tight, so you can't, uh, so it is, it's so loose that you can still move the muscle a little bit back and forth uh, and adjust it up to a week after the surgery. So we use the, the hidden adjustable sutures, the short tag sutures, and then we have a Faden suture behind, and then it's a little bit, um, it's not so tight on the, on the eye, so you can't move the muscle. And, and then we make a little slit on the side where the sutures go through the muscle to be able to move it back and forth uh, if you need to adjust it. Jonathan uh, Holmes has shown this as well. Thank you for uh, your comments. Now I invite uh, the last speaker of the session, uh, Professor Asia. She will be speaking on uh, he will be speaking on late spontaneous rupture of the posterior capsule. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Odasia from uh, Israel, and greetings from Tel Aviv. I would like first to thank the meeting organizer for the invitation to this uh, uh, excellent meeting. My presentation has nothing to do with, uh, uh, with strabismus. Uh, it will be more of a cataract. It will be on late spontaneous rupture of the posterior capsule. And as we all know, this late rupture of the posterior capsule is very rare. It is always associated with some kind of uh, predisposing factors, such as hypermature cataract or posterior polar uh, cataract, pseudo exfoliation, Alport syndrome, and it typically occurs after trauma. So I would like now to present four cases in which we experienced spontaneous posterior capsule rupture. All of them were non-traumatic. 
and they occurred many, many years after implantation of the IOL 17 to 20 years. And in all cases, it was the same intraocular lens or uh, the B lens of Hanita lenses manufactured in Israel. The first case was a, a patient, 70 year old male with cataract on both sides in the, the two solvent, and then yet in the bag, IOL well centered, well stable. The posterior capsule was intact, and we know it was intact for many years. Vision was perfect. And he also had the rightist in the year uh, 2016. So we have it documented that at that time, the posterior capsule was intact. And then all of a sudden in 2017, he had a drop of vision to 615. The posterior chamber lens was subluxated inferiorly and was located behind the posterior capsule, behind the vertical tear of the posterior capsule. This patient denied any trauma, no laser treatment, no yag, no rubbing. He had some irritation cough, cough, but this was not very significant. And he was treated by repositioning and scleral fixation of the lens by Prolin 90. And uh, the uncorrected vision in one month was perfect, 6, 7.5. The second case, 75 year old male, he also had an eventful cataract surgery 20 years ago. The documented eye exam showed intact posterior capsule, and then all of a sudden, loss of vision, no trauma, vision dropped to 660, and the IOL located behind the posterior capsule. I treated him by repositioning the lens to the sulcus with good uncorrected uh, visual acuity. Third case, 54-year-old male with a sudden loss of vision 17 years after the, uh, the implantation. Again, no trauma. The lens again was located behind the posterior capsule and I repositioned by suturing the lens to the sclera using 10-O prolin <clears throat> and with a, a very good uh, clinical result. Four case, 68-year-old male, also operated year 2000. He had retinal detachment operation three months after uh, uh, the initial operation with the sclera buckle and the cryo, but the lens was the posterior capsule was intact for 19 years. And then again, a drop of vision, IOL, most of it behind the posterior capsule. And I fixated this lens to the iris with excellent results. Okay, 12 months post-operatively. Oh, I'm sorry, but some problem with my presentation, sorry. Okay, uh, uh, we should have uh, seen the video here. Uh, and uh, what I did in this video, and I apologize for the problem with the transmission here, uh, I sutured the lens to the sclera by passing the middle through the lens material. And this is something which I'm doing it more and more now, and one can suture through the lens itself. I did it in, in uh, uh, with hydrophobic lenses, hydrophilic lenses, silicon lenses, and in all cases, it, was, uh, it worked uh, uh, very nicely. And I do apologize that it doesn't seem to work here. Anyway, the question is, why did the capsule break? In all cases, we did not have any trauma, no capsular pathology. And uh, one case at retinal detachment, but it occurs many, many years earlier. There are several things which were common in all these cases. All of them were male. All of them were operated 17 to 20 years earlier, and all of them the same lens, the B lens of Hanita lens. The posterior capsule were absolutely clear and clean. There were no cells, no fibrosis, nothing was seen on, on, this, uh, um, on this posterior capsule. They all had a vertical break and all the IOLs were behind the posterior capsule, meaning that there was no capsular adhesions. And also it is not very typical to see a tear, a break in the posterior capsule, which extends from one side to the other side. If we puncture, like for example, in the eye laser, it is very local, it does not extend. It behaved if it, it, it was a virgin capsule. Again, I would apologize, I do not see any of my, uh, uh, my um, photos here, but uh, the billions is a one piece hydrophilic lens with a biconvex optic with square edges and modified seal loop. And this lens is manufactured by many, many other uh, companies. So it was a very common lens. Now we do not see these lenses. And uh, uh, again, sorry, I do not see uh, uh, the, all the, the, photo, the, the pictures. I may need, let me just see if I, I, if I can bring it up. Can you see my, my, uh, my photos here on the right? Yes. Okay, so I'll show it on, on, on the 
smaller right because I'm uh, sorry to not see it in the, in the presentation. But what we can see the IR when it is located within the capsular bag, then the capsule contracts. And when it contracts, it actually creates kind of an arrowhead, which is right here. And this creates a stria on the posterior capsule. And the, since the capsule is so thin, it may create a break in the capsule and then the lens goes backwards and falls into the vitreous cavity. And as we can see, and again, I apologize, we did not see it very clearly, but as we can see here, oh, there it is. Apologies. As we can see here, the posterior capsule is very, very clear. It's clear like as it is uh, a virgin capsule. So the take care our message number two is that spontaneous rupture of the posterior chamber may occur even many, many years after the implantation. The uh, predisposing factor is actually not the crystalline lens. It is the intraocular lens that, that creates these sharp edges uh, kind of uh, pointing uh, superiorly. And uh, uh, the clear capsule, which is very good optically, is not very good as a supporting capsule. And uh, uh, a soft haptic can actually be very hard to the lens. I do apologize for my technical problem here on my computer, but that's my, uh, my message. Do remember that uh, a spontaneous rupture of the posterior capsule is possible. It occasionally occurs very rare, and it is usually related to the intraocular lens, which is now longer, no longer in the market. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for an excellent presentation. And uh, basically, uh, uh, some talks uh, were adjusted uh, in between the sessions to take care of the time uh, difference uh, of the different countries. So it is always uh, uh, a welcome step to listen to non star business surgeons also in star business sessions. Sir. And uh, I think uh, according to you, the cause of posterior capsule rupture was old uh, model of the IUL, which has been used uh, uh, quite long back and uh, is uh, now no longer in use. That's correct. Yeah. So any questions to sir by the panelist? I ask a question. Yeah, yeah. When, okay. When he see the strabismus after this uh, drop of the uh, intraocular lenses, and of course uh, their vision gets uh, uh, rose and maybe go to uh, some deviation. <laughs> if they, uh, if he met uh, any deviation after this uh, cases? No, actually not really, because uh, these are they are treated very early. I mean, okay. once they occur. There's the, the, the immediate drop of vision, and then within days we correct them. So okay. uh, no time for for the for deviation. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. I have a question for you. Um, didn't you have uh, some remainings of the of the anterior capsule in order to place the intraocular lens there instead of, of suturing it to spare? Uh, yes, we could. In one case, we are, uh, we actually um, brought the lens forward and implanted in the surface because we had a very nice. In the other cases, uh, there was not enough capsule to rely on for a long term. So we just suture through the lens and we uh, suture it to the sclera or to the iris just as additional support. You don't want this lens to fall again. If you fall one time, you don't want to do it again. Any other questions? Uh, uh, I believe there is a question uh, in the Q&A box, if you could check that, sir. Dr. Galton and uh, Dr. Rosario. Yeah. So that session will start at five. All right. So uh, I believe all the questions have been completed. And uh, we are approximately five minutes ahead of time. It's all thanks to the speakers and uh, each and everyone present over here for keeping their time. Um, Dr. Subhasa, since we have a few minutes, would you like to say a few words before we conclude this session? 
basically i would like to thank each and everybody for participating and making it a wonderful interactive uh, session and on behalf of delhi ophthalmological society i thank all the speakers part, and delegates uh, uh, for uh, taking part and uh, for excellent presentations so with your uh, uh, i can with your permission can we move to the next session sir yeah yeah all right uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us we hope to see you soon physically as this lockdown gets over hopefully in the next year or even sooner than that thank you so much as we move to our next session i require uh, invite the chairpersons to please come up ahead and also uh, switch on the camera and mute themselves we've got dr rosario gomez uh, we've got dr sayan oskan we've got dr galton was consilis uh, we've also got dr subhas dania who was there in the previous session as well he's with us again we've also got dr chong ben sai and uh, we've got the moderator dr rosario gomez who is going to take the session forward uh, i request our chairperson uh, dr rosario to please uh, take it ahead from here thank you yes so good morning uh i would go to the first slide just to uh, let everybody know we are 3 uh, minutes ahead of schedule so if you would like to uh, talk about the weather or the situation that is happening that is also good yeah we can because, utilize 3 uh, minutes for that yes because what happens is as all the delegates come in we would like to wait for them because many of us if i am a delegate i would like to wait for the speaker and i would be really disheartened if the speaker has already started and i have not come it's more like a movie right now when you go inside the theater and the movie is already started so in the meanwhile you could the panel is open we could if you could all unmute yourselves you could uh, talk to each other and get started in the next 3 uh, minutes i would give you a cue just as we are close to the starting time thank you uh, yes just it is a question uh, i saw that the previous talks you gave them all at, all at once and then you began with the moderation usually we did differently but maybe for you it is uh, better in, in order that we don't have uh, too little time at the end for one speaker just to give all the talks at once because they are subjects they are not individual cases and at the very end we will discuss first the two and then so if you agree we will do like this okay yeah. so we can discuss uh, initial two first and then last two at the end yes if you wish because there are two two from paralysis and then we can go to the other two so we can control that we use half an hour first and then we yeah. don't go to 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 yes but we don't forget the subjects i think it's much better in that way okay so how how is situation in your country ma'am Well fine i mean uh, uh the um, we see a lot the impact of the of the um, of the um, how to say of the um, vaccine uh because we the, the the issue in spain as in italy is that we had a very 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 strong first wave in which we had unfortunately lots of people that got the covid and lots of people that passed the way because we didn't know how to treat them and now we have a huge amount of persons that had the covid and also an amount of persons that they are vaccine so the following waves they are have much less impact and um and uh thanks god also the doctors know much better how to treat them so uh, i suffered in my own uh yeah. hands having my husband one month ago with the covid and uh appreciated so much the the really experience of all the of all the people that they are now know much better when to act how to act and being much more aggressive and also that uh among the colleagues the doctors that we are all vaccinated since a couple of months there's a such a low rate of covid that uh i'm so um, I, i i mean i'm so happy that the vaccine looks to have A, a very big role so we are much better now that's good say, to hear that yes Hello. dr subhash i think uh, we can get started we are just approximately uh, one minute yes it's 5 o'clock yes dr yeah. subhash you were saying something 
No, uh, then uh, uh, we can get started. Rosario, uh, Rosario, you can start. Yes. Yeah, okay. So I start. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are. First of all, I'm very happy that you invite the International Strabismological Association to share uh, some of our talks. We are going to uh, speak on four subjects. Our panel is included from people that really don't need to be introduced. They represent different parts of the continents where ISA is spread. First, it will be Dr. Chon Bin Tsai. He will speak on ocular motor palsies, then Dr. Shushaba Daideya, then Seyhan Otskan and Galton Vasconcelos. I would like first to introduce them one by one, and then they will speak afterwards. First, uh, it will be Dr. Chon Bing Tsai. He's working in Taiwan. He's in the, the Christian Hospital in Taiwan in the Department of Ophthalmology. He is a very active ISA counselor, and he works in the Information and Web Seb website committee, and he's going to speak us on Moscow transposition in ocular motor policy. Then we will have Dr. Dadeya uh, uh, Subash. I think in this meeting doesn't need a big introduction. Nevertheless, he's professor of, of ophthalmology and director of the, um, at the Guru Naya Eye Center. And uh, he's president of the Delhi Ophthalmological Society. He was a former president and secretary of the Strabismus and Pediatric Ophthalmologic Society of India. And he's president of the Faculty of Association of Maulana Azad Medical and College and Associated Hospital. And he will speak in diagnosis and management of the monocular elevation deficits. And because of the they are closed, both two first topics. After this, we will do a stop and we will discuss both two subjects. Then we will go to Dr. Seyhan Oskan from Aydin, Turkey. She was professor of ophthalmology at the Adan Medrez University Medical School in Aydin. And she works in the private clinic, Aydin. She was former president of everything. She was from ISA. She was the former president from ISA. And I'm very happy because she helps me enormously whenever is needed. She's an excellent speaker and she will speak on what to do next if the cause of restriction is our surgery. And last but not least, we will go to the other continent, to, to America and Dr. Galton Vasconcelos from Belo Horizonte, Brazil. He is also full professor at the Ophthalmology and Medical School in Minas Gerais University in Brazil. He's director of Strabismus and Pediatric Ophthalmology and Low Vision Unit at this same university. And he is presently the editor of the International Strabismological Association. And he will speak on the profile of treated patients with restrictive myopathy related to graves of the orbitopathy at the university-based hospital in Brazil. And uh, before I leave you to the first speaker, I would like to, uh, to give you some tips about our organization. It's the larger organization in the world only dedicated to strabismus. And uh, we wish to have the most representative pay, uh, uh, experts from all over the world in it. Anyone who wants to access to it, we have there the link. And we have two meetings that we have ahead of us. The first is the both joint meeting ESA and ISA that will be the next weekend. We have the program, it's an excellent program that will be within one week. And the one who wants to join, it is there. And then we have the next year, the ISA meeting that will be in Cancun also, that will be in September. And I give you here the detail for the one who want to join us. So I'll, I, I unshare my, uh, my screen and give the, Word to Dr. Chon Bin Tsai. Thank you very much for participating. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for today of the module of society for uh, inviting me to the uh, virtual conference. 
Today, I'd like to talk about the muscle transposition in oculomotor palsy. The oculomotor nerve divided into superior division and inferior division after entering the orbit. The superior division innovated uh, superior rectus uh, and divided palpebra as priorities. The inferior division innovated medial rectus, inferior rectus, and inferior oblique. The nerve maintains topographic orientation even in the midbrain. So lesions almost anywhere may cause individual nerve palsy. In ocular motor palsy, one or more muscle may be involved, which will result in uh, from long tall, uh, vertical and torsional strabismus, and may be complicated by uh, aberrant regeneration, pulses, and people involvement, and deficient in uh, various phenomena. So then my focus is the muscle transposition in ocular motor palsy. Therefore, I will focus on the condition involving a uh, rectus muscle. In partial ocular motor palsy, there may be pulses of one rectus muscle. It may be or horizontal or vertical, or pulses of two uh, rectus muscle, which usually involve one uh, horizontal and one vertical muscle. In complete ocular motor nerve palsy, uh, there is a uh, uh, all three rectus muscle will be involved. For the management of one rectus muscle palsy, if the SO deviation is larger than 20 present juncture, traditional recession resection often results in recurrence. Uh, transposition or adjacent uh, rectus muscle should be considered. The adjacent procedure is a partial tendon uh, union procedure. However, the paralytic rectus muscle is usually uh, hypotrophic and the muscle union might become loosened later. The neck procedure is a four tendon transposition procedure. However, some surgeons will consider the, the four tendon transposition with the risk of anterior segment ischemia. Tamoshan procedure is a partial tendon transposition, which reduces the risk of ischemia. And Nishida reported a procedure of partial tendon transposition without tenotomy. I will describe the procedure in full detail. Nishida reported the procedure in 2003, takes a sex nerve policy as an example. The superior tests and inferior tests are split in half. A sex or non absorbable suture is pressed at 8 to 10 millimeters from the insertion. The half of the muscle is attached as a scara besides the margin of lateral rectus at 8 millimeters from the limbus. A medial rectus uh, recession may be added for some cases. Nishita later modified the procedure in 2013. The rectus muscle can be transposed without splitting, and the, the attachment can be at the midpoint of two rectus muscles to avoid the difficulty to transpose the strong muscle tendon adjacent to little rectus. This one is a 65 years old male. He had a partial motor palsy with right a medial rectus palsy. The right superior rectus and right inferior rectus were normal. Here is the surgical video of Nishita procedure of sex nerve palsy. The inferior rectus was marked at 8 to 10 millimeter from the insertion. And the superior rectus was also marked at 8 to 10 millimeter from the insertion. And then the, the attached side uh, besides the lateral rectus was marked at 10 millimeter from the limbus. It's better to make both marks before transposition because once you uh, transpose the first muscle, the eyeball will rotate and change your orientation for making the second marks. The two important parameters of Nishida procedure is the position of placement of suture and position of reattachment. In this case, the suture were placed at 8 mm from insertion and reattachment at 10 mm from dimbus, and right later rectus uh, recession were added. Uh, the patient was also topic after operation. For partial ocular motor palsy involving two rectus muscles, a typical situation is an inferior divisional palsy involving the middle rectus, inferior rectus, and inferior vague, which will result in esotropia, hypotropia, and encyclotropia. 
Hunter Kushner had published a, a report about surgical treatment of inferior divisional palsy or oculomotor nerve. He used the technique reported by NAP in 1978, which included transpose the SR to the injection or MR and transpose the uh, LR to the injection or IR and SO tenotomy. He added a point that for a prior recess, the SR and LR, the transposition should follow the spiral or tilux to maintain the same distance from the limbus. Case two is a 20 years old female. She had a left exotropia and hypertropia after a traffic accident. This is a case of inferior divisional palsy or oculomotor motor nerve. She also had an aberrant innovation of a left upper eyelid. She received a partial tendon transposition of half of SR and LR to the injection of MR and IR. After the transposition, she had a residual exotropia and hypertropia. That is, the procedure created insufficient anti-ducting force and too much depression forces. Therefore, we retranspose the inferior half of LRLR to the inferior corner of LMR. The hypertropia was corrected and the exotropia was reduced to anti-prison juncture. She also had the aberrant innovation of that upper eye. The tosis can be improved when the right eye was exotropic at a uh, 45% chapter. Therefore, she received a larger, uh, large recession and plication of the right eye to correct the tosis of that eye. For complete oculomotor passes, there are three rectus muscle involved. The possible surgical treatment include a uh, uh, large recession and resection. LR disinjection and reattachment to the lateral periosteum, verbal fixation to the uh, nasal of orbital periosteum, and nasal upper transposition of SO tendon, and the procedure of medial transposition of spirit uh, lateral rectus, which was reported by, Ta by Taylor in 1989. I will present this technique in more details. The medial transposition of spirit lateral rectus uh, is to spread the lateral rectus which is the only functional uh, rectus muscle uh, spread in half and transpose both head to the medial side of the probe to collect the esotopia. In this procedure, the dental rectus was uh, identified and spread in two halves of 25 millimeters long. The both head was uh, was cured with six O vicryo. The superior head was passed under superior orbit and superior rectus and the inferior half was passed under the inferior oblique and inferior letters with the guidance of a gas foot. The transposed half was then reattached near the insertion of the medial rectus. The group was kept slightly adducted in the end of the surgery. Case 3 is a 22 years old a female who had the right esotropia and hypotropia after ICH and hydrocephalus. Her right eye showed limited adduction, elevation, and depression. This is a complete right oculomotor palsy. She received a medial transposition of spirit lateral rectus and was also tropic after operation. Dr. Linda Degi uh, conducted an international survey of the result of the procedure. Uh, the, pr the survey collected 88 patients with a median age of uh, 33 uh, uh, years. Um, and in Taiwan, we contribute a, a test of, for this survey. The etiology includes uh, congenital uh, neoplasmic and uh, trauma. 25% of the uh, patients had a prior epithelial strabismus surgery. The median deviation was 70 uh, prison chapter preoperatively and 15 prison chapter postoperatively. The total successful rate for horizontal alignment within 15 minutes was 67%. There are two interesting findings of the survey. 100% of the 16 patients with simultaneous SO tenotomy achieved the successful horizontal alignment. It's possible that because of the SO is an AB doctor, SO tenotomy may enhance the procedure, which is often undercorrected. And the procedure seems to have a cell correcting effect, which means that the magnitude of the uh, reduction in exotopia linearly related to the magnitude of uh, preoperative deviation. It's possible that the larger, in larger deviation, the data rectus may be tighter and will provide a larger force when in transpose. The survey also reported 11% of uh, vision threatening complications. There were seven uh, serious detachment or result spontaneous 
one anterior segment ischemia with no change in visual acuity, one transition uh, IOP rise. Most complication was associated with the more posterior placement for, from uh, meteor retinal induction. The possible cause may be the proximity uh, to the vortex band or insufficient splitting of the all LI too tight. For beginner of the procedure, we recommend choosing patient without history or prior surgery, uh, long split or LR. Otherwise, uh, it will be too tight to transpose and equal splitting of LR to avoid rupture of either head. Uh, safer to transpose a spray head to region close to the MR, uh, less than four millimeter. For pre-operative uh, esotopia, uh, larger than 90% uh, 90 present chapter, many enhancement, uh, that's the contralateral surgery of ipsilateral medial retest dissection application. And this is my presentation. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Chan Bing. And we will now uh, have Dr. Professor Shubas Dadeya, and then we will discuss both two talks. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Rosario, and uh, thank you again for assisting me in this uh, symposium. I will be speaking on diagnosis and management of monoocular elevation deficiency. I don't have any financial interest in this presentation. So basically, so monoocular elevation deficiency is defined as inability to elevate paratic eye from any position of gaze, provided ductions are normal in all other positions of gaze. It may be due to paresis of superior rectus and inferior oblique with process, or it may be due to long-standing superior rectus policy. Initial term was DEP. Double elevator policy was the initial term. This was coined by Dunlop. It can be congenital or acquired. It may be paretic or restrictive, or it may be supranuclear. Monoocular elevation deficiency is more accurate term as paralysis of both muscles independently and supranuclear lesions can lead to impaired unilateral base policy. So now the term MED is used rather than DEP. It may be congenital due to supranuclear defects. It may be due to paresis of the superior rectus or restriction of the inferior rectus. In acquired cases, it may be due to CVSD, disease, midbrain tumors, pinocytoma, acoustic neuroma, and metastatic tumors can lead to acquired MED. Sarcoidosis and infections are other causes of acquired MED. And cysticercosis is an important cause of acquired MED in our setting. You see, ultrasound picture of a patient with beautiful spolex and the patient presented with MED. Various types of MED have been described. Type 1 MED where inferior rectus restriction is a prominent feature and it is common type. Then type 2 MED where there is predominantly thickness of elevators and type 3 MED which is combined by it. So what are the clinical features? Limitation of elevation above midline, both in abduction and adduction is classical feature of MED. Hypotropia of the involved eye, 
patient usually fixate with normal eye and if patient is fixating with abnormal eye then you can see in some cases hypertrophy then ptosis and pseudotosis is another feature these are the clinical photographs of one of the patients then chin elevation is seen in many patients MED is usually unilateral, but bilateral MED is also known. In approximately 25% of the patients, jaw winking phenomena is associated in cases of MED. This is the patient with chin elevation. This is a photograph of another patient of MED. So it is very important to ask history of onset. And if sequence of events is not clear, then presence of amblyopia suggests congenital etiology. You must look for previous photographs. And in acquired cases, you must ask history of neurological symptoms, past medical history, and general systemic symptoms. In type 1 MED, the FDT is positive. Normal FGT, normal states, Bell's phenomena is negative. In type 2 MED, FDT is negative. Then in acquired D, we have to differentiate congenital MED from acquired MED. In acquired MED, usually there is acute acquired diplopia in a face. Ptosis is usually not a prominent feature. You can see pupillary abnormalities, convergence weakness, and neurological symptoms. So if these symptoms are there, neurological symptoms, convergence weakness, pupillary anomalies, and acute acquired diplopia, then most probably we are dealing with acquired MEDRT. Various differential diagnoses of the MED are Brown syndrome, vertical Duane syndrome, congenital fibrosis of inferior rectus, congenital absence of superior rectus and inferior oblique, abnormal insertions of the inferior rectus and superior rectus, and superior divisional third nerve palsy, and they can be differentiated by the defining features. Then in acquired DEP, thyroid orbitopathy, myasthenia gravis, orbital flow fracture, third nerve palsy, orbital cellulitis, orbital inflammatory diseases, previous cataract surgery, and cerebral tumors. They are some of the differential diagnosis for acquired MED. Ocular myasthenia may present in different varieties and it can present as MED. And in one of the patients, it presented as acquired MED. Then what are the indications for surgery? Significant abnormal head posture in primary position. If there is significant vertical deviation in primary position, there is contacted binocular field, diplopia in primary case, because in most of the patients, you can wait and watch with limited head changes and patient can obtain orthopathy. So we have to do surgery, not in each and every case, but only in those patients in which there is abnormal head significant abnormal head posture and significant vertical deviations in primary position. And treatment for MED, congenital MED is surgical and only surgical. What are the goals for surgery? We want to achieve cosmetic, cosmetically acceptable deviation in the primary position to increase the field of binocular single vision and it is very important to tell to the patient that the disease will not be cured and more than one surgery is required and process surgery 
should be done after star bismar surgery so it is very important and i would like to emphasize this point because most of these patients they come with the complaint of ptosis and they insist on doing the ptosis surgery so we should always do the star bismar surgery first and the ptosis surgery should be followed by the star bismar surgery and patient must be tell in very clear terms that more than one surgery will be required in these patients various surgical procedures have been de described for med optical surgical treatment for med rdp remains controversial and treatment should be according to type of med <laughs> in our setting this uh, type 1 med where there is restriction of the inferior rectus is more commonly seen and recession of the involved inferior rectus is procedure of choice we should do first fdt and then do the recession of the involved inferior rectus in type 2 med where <coughs> predominantly there is weakness of elevators naps procedure has been is procedure of choice it is well established it is commonly practiced however the drawback of naps procedure is patient loses some amount of abduction and adduction and you cannot uh, do horizontal surgeries uh, and then affectivity decreases if the deviation is more than 25 prism diopters so these are some of the steps of the naps procedure basically we isolate medial and lateral rectus and attach it <coughs> to the superior rectus then there are other procedures esotinectomy and vertical muscle resections have been found to be effective modalities in congenital dp by one of the chinese d sneer m et al recommends naps procedure with posterior fixation sutures for med and <laughs> there is one specific entity where med is associated with horizontal deviation and particularly in our indian circumstances most of the patients they don't want or they don't allow to be operated on normal fellow i and if you do the naps procedure then you cannot do uh, the horizontal surgery simultaneously in that i so in this uh, modified naps procedure <coughs> you partially divide the medial and lateral rectus into two parts and superior part is used for ver vertical correction and lower part is used for horizontal correction this is the pre operative photograph of one of the patients of med these are the post operative photograph then pre operative photograph of another patient then post operative photograph in during early period then this is the pre operative photograph of another patient with the med and you see in the upper part after splint surgery and finally the photograph of the patient after ptosis surgery so when to intervene for ptosis you should wait minimally for 6 months after splint surgery because magnitude for vertical correction increases with time following naps procedure thank you very much for your kind attention savians yes thank you very much so we are going to discuss very briefly those two talks uh and because the last one was the monocular elevation deficit and we have it more in the mind i will ask you first because i don't see any question for the from the audience when you try to use the dr uh, subash when you use the inferior part of the muscle in yeah. order to correct the horizontal deviation uh that brought me uh, to my mind the compartmental surgeries and usually with those surgeries 
we are, uh, first of all, how you calculate it. Do you use the same tables for the horizontal deviation? And if so, do they have a different effect on near a distance as they do when we do in other cases, based on the compartmental theories now that we are using the inferior part for the near distance, the first superior part more for the, or you didn't see any any difference in the distance and near deviation. Um, um, uh, the idea for this procedure came to uh, our mind. Basically in our setting, some patients, they presented with uh, MED with horizontal deviation. Mm -hmm. And the patient, basically we intended to plan the NAPS procedure in the affected eye and horizontal surgery in the normal eye. But the mm -hmm. problem was that patient did not allow to touch the normal eye. So what to do? The question was uh, that. So uh, we thought and we devised this technique and uh, we have uh, presented it uh, in the American Academy of Ophthalmology long back in 1998. Uh, and we have published it also in ophthalmic surgery and lasers. And in our setting, the effect was approximately, we were able to correct about uh, 20 to 25 prism diopter uh, of the horizontal deviation and uh, about 22 prism diopter of the vertical deviation with this procedure. And you use the same tables as for a traditional surgery? I mean, the dose. No, the, the effect. Uh, because uh, if you will, if you are using the half muscle, then the effect is going to be less. So we thought whatever we gain, uh, whatever uh, we gain, it will be better uh, than nothing. So basically, okay. uh, so cosmetically, it will be better. So that was okay. the idea. Okay. Um, and then there's a question to Dr. Chon Bin Tsai on the ocular motor policy. I know that, well, there is big changes with it all over those years on our techniques and we pass it from the caruncular surgeries, recess, resect, different types of transposition using the superior oblique. Now we have some, also some Nishida procedures. And in the last meetings, I saw also transposing the superior oblique to the lateral rectus and at anterior posing it, which is a quite easy technique and not very aggressive. And I think we need more results before expanding this technique, but it's very promising. But I will go, I will go to the technique that you discussed a little bit more, which is the splitting of the lateral rectus and bringing it to the nasal side. And my questions, do you do with adjustable suture? And that was a question that I received from Dr. Goisik. Do you use adjustable sutures in it? And uh, if you pass the muscles below as she does, below the inferior and superior oblique and below the inferior and superior rectus. If you can precise us this, your technique. Okay, uh, first, uh, the key point of the splitting the lateral rectus is the, to sprint as long as backward as possible. So you can use two uh, uh, SO tendon uh, hook and to, 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 to divide and, uh, and, and and because the the singular tip of the uh, SO tendon hook is about 25 millimeters. So you just bury inside the muscle and brand it, divide and when, when the, the, the tip are all uh, buried in, you know you have spread 25 millimeters. A uh, second uh, to uh, transpose, uh, I, I transpose it uh, beneath the, uh, I mean under between the muscle and the, the probe the inferior letters, inferior oblique, and superior, and superior under the superior letters and superior oblique. And it's difficult to, uh, to pass behind the superior oblique. So I'm happy to hear the Dr. Lin does uh, a uh, report that uh, SO tenotomy can be performed. So we, it's easier to, to pass, uh, not have to pass behind the superior oblique. And the uh, less, uh, if, whether I use the adjustable suture um, I have used that in one or two cases, but uh, later I found it, it's very difficult to, to do adjustable suture because uh, the, uh, the transport muscle is very tight and uh, I have to uh, adduct the, uh, the group to make the suture tight, otherwise it will loosen it by itself. And I, as I, I presented, most of the case, if, 
even if you transpose it uh, too successfully to the insertion of media letters, it will always uh, usually just uh, fully corrected or under corrected. So certain where you got a uh, uh, over corrected. So uh, in that position, I I literally I don't use that accessible suture because uh, afraid of the easily loosening of the 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 the, the surgery. So thank you very much. So uh, as we don't have any more questions here, and if we have them, we will do it at the end. I will go to Dr. Sehan Oskan, Professor Sehan Oskan from Turkey, to share the screen. And to... So do you see my slide as I can see? Yes, Ehan, they are visible. Okay. Thank you. And absolutely clear, loud and clear. So thank you very much. So uh, dear colleagues and uh, dear moderator, first of all, I would like to thank for the kind invitation of Delhi Ophthalmological Society and especially to Professor Sapesh Dadaya and Professor Namrata Sharma and also to the International Strabismological Association and uh, also Dr. Rosario Gomez de Liano for kindly inviting me for, to, to speak at this outstanding meeting. And I have no potential conflict of interest to disclose. So we all know that the aim of strabismus surgery is to correct the ocular misalignment and to keep the eyes aligned in nine positions of gaze. However, the strabismus surgery itself may be the reason for misalignment and the limitation of ocular motility. So during this talk, I'm going to talk about potential reasons, preventive measures, and then finally treatment of such problems. So when we see any limitation of ocular motility in the postoperative period after strabismus surgery, we consider whether this can be due to a disinsertion, slippage, or excess recession, or it may be whether it is due to a restriction or not. So in order to find out, we need to do some tests and forced action tests, forced generation tests, IOP changing gaze positions, and if available, saccadic velocity measurements can be very helpful for this. So the problem that causes a restricted ocular movement may be at the extraocular muscle, at the conjunctiva, or soft tissue surrounding the extraocular muscles, or there may be some orbital adhesions that possibly affect the extraocular muscle pulleys. So which tissue is responsible for the restricted eye movements? So we need to perform forced action tests if we are going to reoperate such a case. And we need to repeat the test before conjunctival opening at all stage before dissection of the conjunctiva after dissecting the extraocular muscle and even after severing the extraocular muscle, which indicates the presence of orbital fibrosis and sometimes some remnants or so of supernumerary muscles as well. So Jampolsky described the term of leash and reverse leash effects. So the tissue that causes a restriction may limit the rotation in the opposite field of gaze as well as in the same direction. So uh, when we consider the etiology uh, regarding strabismus surgery, it may, the restrictions may develop after excessive shortening of an extraocular muscle or due to inadvertent capture of neighboring oblique muscles or due to transposition surgery, or due to formation of adhesions and scar tissue. So in re considering resection problem, the preventive measure is not to exceed conventional amounts. And this is also valid for application surgeries as well. So tight muscles should not be resected and adjustable resections should be performed where possible. And checking the forced action test after resection in all strabismus surgery cases uh, is a major step for prevention. So if such a problem occurred, the management is actually to recess the resected muscle or uh, some uh, muscle elongation procedures were described and botulinum toxin A to uh, lengthen the muscle into the uh, injection to, into the resected muscle may be very useful, especially during the early postoperative period. So let me demonstrate a case example. This child has a cerebral palsy with Parino syndrome 
And uh, so she underwent uh, super replacement of horizontal rectus muscles in both eyes. And uh, in combination with a small recess resect procedure in her right eye due to the isotropia, moderate isotropia. And on postoperative first day, it was a bad surprise. So there was a large consecutive exo deviation with significant limitation of adduction. So when seeing such a uh, problem, I first considered that this may be due to a disinsertion of the medial rectus muscle. So uh, she was reoperated on postoperative fourth day. And the first action test, to my surprise, was plus four positive on adduction. And that there was nothing wrong with the medial rectus muscle. And the uh, resected lateral rectus muscle was recessed for five millimeters. So in other words, the resection was neutralized and the first action test was negative at the end of surgery. However, on the postoperative first week, she was still uh, with this uh, consecutive exo deviation. And despite it decreased, there was a, uh, again a significant limitation of adduction. So at this stage, what was wrong? So uh, in cerebral palsy cases, the extraocular muscles may behave with abnormal contractility problem as it is in their skeletal muscles. So uh, we have performed a uh, botulinum toxin injection into her right lateral rectus muscle. And this is her appearance six months later and she remains stable with that. So in uh, resections, in reoperations of resections, we need to sometimes re-resect a muscle. And the challenge is there is no reliable data how much to re-resect an, an extraocular muscle. So, and sometimes there is no reliable data uh, about the previous resection. So the amount of resection is totally determined due to the uh, forced action test during surgery. And tucking of superior oblique tendon is uh, as one of the reasons uh, to get some postoperative restrictions. And the preventive measure is not to tuck the superior oblique muscle if there is no tendon laxity and to repeat the forced action test before closure. And this uh, child has a congenital right superior oblique palsy and with a very large deviation. So he underwent a inferior oblique disinsertion plus superior oblique tuck. And postoperatively, he had right Brown syndrome. So I must say that this amount of Brown syndrome is not a problem, and it usually resolves in time. So, and, and it, this was also the case in, in this patient, and this is his appearance in postoperative five months. So there's a spontaneous resolution. However, if the tucking procedure is performed in a patient who do not have any tendon laxity, this Brown syndrome never resolves in time. So in this lady, this is an acquired fourth nerve palsy and after tuck surgery that was done in another institution, there is a persistent Brown syndrome. So restricting uh, may develop related to capture of neighboring extraocular muscles. And this is usually the oblique muscles and uh, especially in inferior oblique muscle, lateral rectus muscle may be captured. And so lateral rectus muscle must be hooked from superior quadrant and uh, avoiding uh, blind hooking is another uh, significant preventive measure. So transpositions may also end up with some restrictions so the preventive measure is to keep parallel to the spiral of TO and augmentation sutures, if it is going to be used, must be parallel and symmetric. And in this first action test is positive. Rosenbaum recommends to recess the transverse muscle during the surgery. So this lady has a, an acquired left six nerve palsy and she underwent an augmented vertical rectus transposition procedure into her, her left eye. And this is after the operation, no medial rectus weakening was performed for this lady. But despite that, you can see that there's a limitation of adduction and there is a small exo deviation on adduction. So this result is actually something that we desire uh, in, in a six nerve palsy, but we need to be aware about the uh, restrictive effect of transposition surgery. So inferior oblique anterior transposition is another type of surgery which is commonly performed and it may end up with anti-elevation syndrome. So the preventive measure is to suture the anterior and posterior fibers in a bunch of fashion and to avoid passing the suturing the muscle uh, anterior to the inferior rectus insertion. 
So this child underwent uh, inferior oblique anterior transposition in her both eyes, and she developed anti-elevation syndrome afterwards, and you can also see the fullness of the lower eyelids. So the restrictions uh, may be related to postoperative scar tissues and adhesions, and these problems are usually um, dependent on the surg uh, surgical technique, actually. So these scar tissues and adhesions may be at the conjunctiva tenons capsule intermuscular membrane in the muscle, in the sclera, and even in the orbital fat tissue, which is uh, called as adherence syndrome by Parks. So it typically occurs during uh, following inferior oblique surgery, but it may develop in any extraocular muscle surgery and it develops due to the penetrance of posterior tenons capsule and surgical disruption of orbital fat. And there's a loss of elasticity of the septa in the extraconal space. So the preventive measures are non-traumatic surgery, good control of hemorrhage, avoiding too deep incision, avoiding blind hooking, avoiding penetrance of posterior tenons capsule, and the materials and drugs to reduce some postoperative scarring. So inferior oblique muscle surgery is the uh, is claimed most for development of adherence syndrome. So the as you see here uh, in the left photo, avoiding blind hooking is important, and the tip of the hook should be severe, just adjacent to the inferior oblique muscle. And in superior oblique surgery, the posterior tenons capsule must be seen and all the steps of the surgery must be done under direct view and no blind hooking should be done. So there are a number of materials and the drugs to reduce postoperative scar formation. And among those we have studied on separa film in an experimental model and we found it helpful. And uh, when there are uh, previous adhesions and during treatment, uh, we need to release and excise the scar tissue and to recess appropriate extraocular muscles and conjunctiva. And we may need to use materials and drugs to reduce postoperative scarring and toxin may be helpful during the acute phase of such problems. So let me demonstrate a case example. This patient has a right congenital superobic uh, palsy with a very large deviation. So he underwent inferior right inferior oblique disinsertion in combination with adjustable superior rectus recession. During surgery, tiny uh, adipose cells were uh, recognized, uh, but uh, there was no other problem. And on adjustment, he was fine. And so uh, adjustment was completed while he was orthophoric. And in the first day, everything was okay. And in postoperative third day, he had a vomiting attack and so he came back with this condition with a large hypotropia, which was going increasing day by day. And orbital fat tissue was recognized under conjunctiva. So this patient was developing an adherence syndrome. So at this stage, any surgery would increase the problem. So what we could consider was to inject a botulinum toxin into the right inferior rectus muscle in order to elevate this eye. And this is one week after toxin injection. So he was orthophoric. You see the underaction in the inferior, oblique, in inferior rectus muscle. And this is two months after toxin injection. So the effect here was like a traction seizure and he remained stable like this. So what was the mechanism here? Botulinum toxinase stabilized the eye in primary position during the fibroadipose tissue proliferation. When the tissue proliferates, it pulls the eye uh, in the, uh, um, towards the uh, inflammatory reaction. So but when we inject toxin here, and we, if we are able to keep the eye in primary position, then these inflammatory tissue reaction attached to point B, which is a more posterior point, so <clears throat> which uh, ends up with a less um, severe limitation of ocular motility. So in chronic phase, uh, the adherence syndrome uh, treatment is a challenge and the recession of inferior rectus and recession of conjunctiva is recommended, but the expectation must be realistic. The goal is to achieve primary position alignment. So free eye movements is not possible. So in chronic phase, we need to be aware that scar tissue formation decreases the predictability of strabismus surgery. So once the integrity of the facial system is lost, it's not possible to cure it. And all the surgical attempts to treat the adhesions also create some new adhesions. So the take-home messages are, prevention is far more important than treatment. 
and restrictions due to soft tissue scarring are more complicated than, uh, extra, than extraocular muscle related restrictions. And botulinum toxin may rescue a restriction if it is performed in acute phase. And forced action tests needs to be repeated before, during, and at the end of surgery in all strabismus cases. I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, so I'd like to remind our two um, forthcoming meetings as uh, our president, Rosario Gomez Leliano mentioned in her uh, introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are going to go directly to the last talk. And at the very end, if we have uh, some minutes left, we will discuss both, both uh, talks. Galton, it's your turn. Yes, um, let me share my screen. Okay. Yep. Can you see it? Yep. Um, good morning, everyone from Brazil. Firstly, I want to thank Dr. Subhash uh, and Dr. Uh, Sharma, as well as uh, Dr. Rosario uh, Gomez de Lianho for this kind invitation. Um, well, uh, we are going to talk, Miss. yes, okay. Graves optopathy, it has broad profiles, sometimes very complex and enigmatic um, parameters uh, due to the inflammatory and monological character. And we know uh, serious consequences for vision and life as a systemic disease. So uh, that motivates us to understand deeply how and how, who um, those patients are, lipogenic, myogenic, or mixed. Uh, our series of cases addresses the myogenic patients that come to our extra business clinic. Um, some of them, uh, such as this lady with uh, optic neuropathy, some uh, with no, no, uh, other complications. If we pay attention to official protocols such as the via, uh, Visa and the uh, Google protocols, strabismus is highly relevant to understand and treat this condition. Uh, but we, as we, 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 we are in a strabismus clinic, we consider that um, both in both um, protocols, information is lacking. So we need to, uh, we, nowadays we have our own protocol uh, with more detailed uh, information to, to, to treat those patients. Uh, why we are so much interested in those patients? Because they, they present, as Sehan has presented, variable degrees of restriction. Uh, there is a direct impact on quality of life and functional and a lot of uh, psychological suffering. Uh, Dr. Robert Goldberg, a prominent uh, oculoplastic surgeon, in his talk of oculoplastic in Singapore IT, ITADS 2018, he surprised us when he uh, didn't mention uh, oculoplastic, but he said the strabism is the most important manifestation in thyroid eye disease, and diplopia is the most disabled symptom. Uh, it's, it is important to understand because Brazil, as, 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 as India, for example, uh, has continental dimensions, a lot of miscegenate, ethnic diversity. Uh, we have some uh, specific characteristics and we wanted to know how this, this patients behave. So uh, the inclusion criteria was myogenic, uh, graves or optopic patients, web strabismus, of course, it was observational, transversal, retrospective based in charts. In our extra business clinic, the patients derive from the public Brazilian health system. Uh, many of them have socioeconomic problems and the period was uh, along this uh, almost 20 years. Uh, we selected 40, 40 patients with 12 submitted to surgery. These are the clinical characteristics of our cases. 1.5 new cases per year, 55% of females, the literature describes, 
the the mean age um, in between 25 and 74 years we we have um, um in, in in each topic a lot um, some information based in the literature 80 percent presented hyperthyroid disease at the time of diagnosis um 2.5 other autoimmune disease, 20% uh, um, were submitted to organ decompression previously, and 70.5 uh, optic neuropathy. Concerning this for business, we have uh, a, a, almost 80% mixed strabismus, horizontal and vertical combined. No torsional deviation. This is lack of uh, uh, searching for uh, uh, torsion. Uh, what, what happened to this sample. Um, the mean elevation deficit was minus 2.3 uh, for horizontal and vertical. Concerning the 12 patients uh, submitted to surgery, we are very intrigued by this, this Felden study uh, group. Um, when he says that we have a higher success rate and lower reoperation re rate when we base our success in the limitation deficit parameter. Of course, we have success when we base in our measurements, but we're going to have more reoperations. So we try to understand in our sample um, what, what was the success, success, uh, satisfaction and improvement of that double vision through double vision, when we base our um, success rate in a double vision, when we base our success in the deviation reduction or correction, and uh, we considered, uh, we had to establish a parameter, so we considered a final deviation when we said it was small, it was less than four prism diopters, and for ver and in verticals, and less than 10 prison diopters in horizontal. Of course, we can discuss that. Uh, we studied the balance of versions and um, we wanted that the, the difference in both versions deficits were less than 25% or minus one. So these are the data, average age, it was 50 years old. The average number of uh, surgeries, around two surgeries uh, for, per patient. Number of patients of muscle covers for the first surgery um, in um, uh, 2.2 2 uh, muscles. And when we needed more surgery, one more muscle. 50% of our cases were binocular surgeries and the most used um, uh, uh, technique was adjustable although there is no consensus in literature, and uh, we based more in recess of the affected muscles, as um, Anja Kustein has uh, stated in the literature, many, and in other services around the world as well. Our reoperation rate in our business clinic was around 40%. We have different rates in the literature. Uh, of course, as we didn't uh, fix uh, our goals in the oblique muscles, there was, there was no surgery for oblique muscles. We know the literature has described Federico Vélez and, and other uh, authors. The overcorrection rate was 8%. Uh, we, we see different rates in the literature. See, we have the amount of, of decrease for those patients who had surgery for vertical, uh, 18 prison diopters and four horizontal, 23 prison diopters. Of course, we've, it, for the patients who had no surgery at all, along the inflammation process, if we treat the inflammation process, there is also a decrease in the amount of strabismus for some cases. But we see here that surgery has definitely made a difference uh, in terms of the final vertical size and a horizontal size. So we uh, found that surgery, the, the risk for having good results is 13 times more chances uh, to be satisfied concerning diplopia if you have surgery, 
we have again 13 times more chances if we base in our um, measurements. And uh, differently from what the Feldman group has found, uh, we didn't see that the, 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 the change of success based on the, the uh, version criteria, the, the limitation deficit criteria. So we know, uh, concluding that the best prognosis factor is surgery, that leaving the patient alone with no surgery will decrease the amount of, of, the amount of uh, deviation, but surgery may, makes a difference. 13 times more chance of, of success. Uh, of course, there is a balance of um, um, versions, um, but uh, especially those patients who are uh, bilateral cases, they will, of course, increase the, the balance, but it was not significant. Gender, age, and previous decompression surgery were not factors that include success differently from other um, series of cases in the literature. I think that's, that's all. Thank you, Danya Vaad, Shukriya. Well, I thank you very much, uh, both of the last panelists, but unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, uh, Ma'am, yeah, you can take some time because uh, there is some time uh, in between. Oh, so. marvelous. So I thank you so much. So I enjoy so much first, Sehan, your question, your sentence that you say, which is the tissue responsible of the restricted movement that I think we have to transmit to all our residents. But I have a question. Since you use the botulinum toxins as a traction suture. Do you still use the traction sutures or is that enough? Uh, I must say that since uh, I, I saw that I can use toxin instead of traction sutures, I didn't put any, any, the real traction sutures in any of my patients because I was using this for treatment of a complete third nerve palsy. And in those patients, uh, the results were good, but the traction sutures were uh, kept in place for six weeks. And so this was a technique that I learned from my mentor, John Lee. But uh, so after the, I realized that I can use botulinum toxin, then in, in such patients, uh, I obtained uh, the same result by uh, injecting botulinum toxin with very large supramaximal recess resect procedures in combination with toxin injection into the recessed muscle. So I must say that in, in, in my practice, I nearly gave it up. But of course, I do not want to say uh, very strict words on that because there may be so severe orbital fibrosis problems that, uh, you know, I mean, if you cannot uh, pull the eye in any case when you use your forceps and pull the eye and if you cannot move the eye so uh, not, you, with any um, uh, method you, 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 you cannot be successful because in so, such very severe orbital fibrosis things and I had a patient let's say uh, when I put traction sutures traction sutures in time uh, teared off from the sclera because of the very strong pulling effect of uh, sclera. Uh, they are very painful. Fibrosis, yes, yeah, sorry. So uh, it depends on the case, but I can say that I mostly gave it up. Thank you. And Galton, uh, I enjoyed very much your, your talk because uh, that's a topic that we work very often in, in my country. Um, could you tell us a little bit about when do you operate a patient? Because often those patients need so large time until you can go to, for surgery. Sometimes you stay two years until they, they are there. And even sometimes you have, when you are going to operate, a new thing appears, the myasthenia, the COVID that in some of cases also re, re, rebound them. So could you tell us, in a simple way, when do you operate or which are your protocol for the surgery? Um, well, we, we don't have a fixed time for surgery, but we, we follow the random curve. So when inflammation decreases and sometimes uh, uh, strabismus uh, get worse because mm -hmm. of the restriction, 
And we try to uh, warn the patient about all steps. And, but I think it's important to state that three to six months of stable measurements or stable uh, versions. Uh, otherwise, uh, there is a risk you're gonna have more deviation. We have some cases that, 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 that had surgery and, and at the wrong step, at the wrong phase, at the acute phase, and sometimes they're masked and they get worse. So I think it's important to see the patients uh, often, to see how measurements or versions or double vision is, and then to proceed to surgery. Do you have experience with explants as any action does? Because in very, when you have to do a large recession, for inf instance, an inferior rectus, that you lose the arc of contact, in my experience, they, they is a very good method to use. No, no, no. Uh, I think it's a good method because you you you, you make it uh, you 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 make sure your your uh, large uh, uh, recession is working. This is a problem when we reoperate the patient. Sometimes we know that the the muscle advanced a little bit. So, um, but we don't have an experience in, in that. So. And do you use a just a uh, uh, non-fixed suture in your inferior rectus or? Yes, although um, some of my colleagues, they, they uh, advocate the, the non-observable sutures. Uh, I think uh, maybe uh, in some cases, yes, uh, I think it's, it's a good option. But in terms of, uh, well, for, the, for the, the adjustments, I use the, the, Vi, the, Vi, uh, the Vicro 6 and the Mercillin for traction, for the traction if you are, need to adjust the patient, but for the muscle itself, uh, Vicro, but I, I think I'm wrong. Okay, so I think we have to wrap up. I thank you very much, all the, all the panel for being here for the very, very interesting talks. And I hope to see you next week at the ISA, ISA meeting in Paris. It's going to be an excellent meeting. Thank you very much for attending and thank you very much to the, Delhi Ophthalmological Association for this very kind invitation. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Please take care and stay safe and healthy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. In the meanwhile, uh, our next session is going to be starting in uh, 20 minutes. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Ripka also with us. Uh, we're just waiting for the others to also join in. And as this session did finish in time and uh, we have approximately 20 minutes. We did sometimes, you know, we keep a buffer also 20 minutes to take a break. So here in India, we might just take a quick tea break and be back. Uh, for the others, uh, kindly just hold on. And we're just waiting for the other uh, speakers, moderators, and the chairpersons to join in. Thank you so much. Uh, I would again like to thank all the speakers from the previous session, especially uh, Dr. Rosario for moderating this session very well. Uh, and also keeping it in time as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And Michael, good luck. Hello. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. <laughs> good morning. Good to see you all. Or good afternoon, <laughs> yeah, of course. Too. Well, okay. Nice meeting you organized last week. Huh? Yeah. It was very nice. Okay. Uh, now the session is open for our offline discussions as uh, we've got 20 minutes and uh, we can definitely talk to each other. I think this is one thing that we really miss uh, during these conferences is uh, the, uh, you can say, the networking during a physical conference or having a cup of tea together out outside the hall. So maybe this no, is the time. Is, <laughs> there is no question that's true. Um, I think we've all pretty much had it with Zoom meetings. Um, yeah. Occasionally, they're fine, but day in and day out, they're painful. Yes, because the family thinks that you are here, but you are not here. And, uh, <laughs> and that's, you know, it's, you are here, but you're in the next room. And, and, uh, and I miss the hogs. I mean, I, I have to yeah. say. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, I'm going to, to leave just for a moment. I'm going to listen to the next session. Okay. See you. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Mike. Hi there, hey, Galton, good to see you. Good um, to see you too. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Dedea, we will be um, 
you know, so I will do the moderating. Dr. Jafar will do the intros. At least that's his um, wish. Yes, sir. Uh, the session will start after 20 minutes, sir. Right. No, understood. We'll start.
Thank you for joining us, sir. We've got the co-chairman, Dr. Mohammad Jafar, and we've also got our moderator, Dr. Michael Brebka. Over to our moderator, Dr. Michael. Thank you very much, and good evening to everyone. Um, so we're going to begin this session um, co-sponsored with the American with the APOS or American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus with um, Dr. Donnie Saw, who is a until I guess this week, professor of ophthalmology at the University of Nebraska, and now will be professor of ophthalmology at the University of California, Irvine. Um, so with no further delay, Donnie, why don't you take it away and share screen? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, uh, Mike, can you see uh, uh, the slides okay? We're good. Perfect. Uh, my title is Finite Element uh, Simulation to Explore the Retinal Injury and Abuse of Head Trauma and also other types of sports, like uh, as a result of uh, sports such as soccer. Uh, I have no financial interest to disclose. So abuse of head trauma, although it's actually poorly documented around the world, in United States, it is the most common cause of traumatic death in children under the age of two. And um, the impact of COVID-19 is still not fully understood or uh, had been documented, but we do think that there's an increase in number of cases as a result of significant stress and also confinement within the family. And also we suspect that there's a significant underreporting as well. So in these abusive head trauma, why do these retinal hemorrhages occur? Uh, up to 90% of these babies uh, who have been abused. And also why do these retinal hemorrhages have a, a, a particular pattern uh, that involves the posterior pole as well as all the way into the periphery? And then uh, to, to uh, make it more interesting, it's multi-layered, it involves pre-retinal, interretinal, and subretinal. So there aren't too many conditions that actually has these combinations. Um, one theory is that there's a repetition of linear, also angular uh, acceleration and deceleration with repetition that can result in shearing force at the vitreoretinal interface. Um, and OCT studies have nicely demonstrated a retinal schesis along with the uh, vitreous separations at the vitreoretinal interface at the locations of the pre-retinal hemorrhage. And of course, it will be unethical and impossible to perform these type of experiments in, uh, uh, in uh, humans. So we developed a computer simulation model um, such as this, uh, uh, creating a finite element incorporating all, incorporating all the properties and characteristics of, the, uh, of all the tissues that's within the eye composed of sclera, retina, and vitreous. Not just that, we also create, created a vitreoretinal attachment points along the retinal vessels, posterior pole, and as also at the peripheral part of the retina, creating over 300,000 individual points that we can analyze simultaneously. And, and furthermore, we, create, we subdivided the retina into pre-retinal, sub-retinal, and, um, uh, and, uh, and intra-retinal uh, to look at exactly what's happening within the retinal layer of a 300 microns. And then we shook this computer simulation model very similar to, actually identical to Yamazaki dummy doll model where they created a, a dummy doll and placed the accelerometer in the, the baby doll's eye and also into the perpetrator's hand. And so they were able to uh, identify the exact position of the eye, both in y-axis and x-axis, and looking at the, um, uh, let me see if I can play this. So looking at the uh, velocity and accelerations at any given points, um, Within, uh, within this repetition. And as you can see, as we are shaking this eyeball model in a figure of eight, we can identify and determine exactly what's going on in those 300,000 different points at, at, different, uh, at different time period. And here at the point uh, zero, at, down to the hundredth of a second, we can tell exactly what's happening at different points within the retina. And what we found is that average stress along the retinal vessel was seven kilopascal. And then 
wherever there's a bifurcation, as you can see, you can see the red color, um, and that actually shows an increase, the warmer, hotter the color, increase in um, a stress. And wherever there's a bifurcation, the stress increased to nine to 10 kilopascal. And we also looked at exactly what's going on in different layers of the retina. And you can, as you can see, it's actually pretty similar in all three layers. And it was statistically non-significant. And we compare that to an accidental uh, uh, injury such as a soccer, because it is by far the most common, uh, most popular sport in the world. And we wanted to see how, what type of stress that actually results in the, at the vitreoretinal interface. So we created an, a soccer ball with the exact same dimensions and the weight and traveling at 50 miles an hour. As you can see, as, as soon as there's a contact, there's a wave of force that's transmitted from anterior to posterior segment as it propagates. And the interesting thing is, I'm gonna stop it right there, that there's a significant force that's transmitted from anterior to posterior, fairly localized to the posterior pole. But as soon as the, uh, as soon as the, uh, there's a significant pressure, it actually creates, I'm gonna show this one more time. Uh, as soon as that it hits the posterior pole, that significant force turns into a negative force. So there's a like almost like a vacuum that's created within the eye. And when we looked at the stress along the three different layers, as you can see, it actually looks very different than the, sh than the shaken baby syndrome model. There are two things. First, the, the, the pressure, the force is after the initial contact, it actually decreased substantially. And also, there's a significantly different uh, force that, uh, along the pre-retinal and sub-retinal layer. And it, as you can see, it's actually with the, the, with the shaken baby, uh, baby syndrome model, the force is actually gradually increased, especially with the repetition. So what we found is that in obesive head trauma finite element model, it demonstrated that shaking an eye can produce a significant linear and angular force at the vitreoretinal interface. And this force is gradually increased rep with repetition. And this can, and, and it is not just simply increased, but it's compounded. And that can result in material fatigue, uh, resulting in vitreoretinal, um, uh, vitreoretinal separations, resulting in tearing of the blood vessels. And also, wherever there's a bifurcation, it experienced a greater stress. Of course, in peripheral retina, there's a greater number of bifurcation vessels that may explain the diffuse nature of the retinal hemorrhage and abusive head trauma. And all three layers experience a similar stress level. And this also explains why the retinal hemorrhages that's found in abusive head trauma is typically in all three layers. On the contrast, with the soccer, bar, a soccer ball model, there's a greater initial uh, a, a translational force that's experienced at the vitreoretinal interface, but it decreases very, very quickly. And as the force is transmitted from the interior to posterior direction, most of the force is, is experienced at the posterior pole. And the pre-retinal layer experienced far greater than sub-retinal layer. And this explains why the soccer-related injuries, uh, injuries mostly experienced uh, uh, the, the um, um, you, you typically see a vitreous hemorrhage along with the pre-retinal and intra-retinal layers and less common in the sub-retinal layers. So in conclusion, Based on our uh, finite element model, forces generated during shaking can create a very unique pattern at the vitreoretinal interface distinct from the linear force uh, injury, uh, such as soccer. And this explains the unique retinal, this may explain the re uh, unique retinal hemorrhage patterns in abusive head trauma. And we're, right now we're working on a, a various uh, different models, including explosion related to traumatic brain injury and retinal findings, and how eye protections uh, uh, change the impact of the vitreoretinal interface. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Dr. Saw, for those comments. If you could unshare um, to the audience, we're going to take a few moments to see if um, there are questions for Dr. Saw. Uh, Donnie, I was going to ask about uh, you know this the linear trauma that you were seeing with um, 
soccer injuries, uh, any other analogous injuries um, to, to that? I was trying to think if, say, airbag deployment could be do a similar thing to the eye, or if you think that's yeah. different. Sure. Uh, so the shaken baby syndrome model or abusive head trauma model actually creates a very unique vitreoretinal retinal um, um, interfa uh, interaction because uh, with the angular accelerations, there's a lot more shearing force, like a side to side like this. With the translational injury, that's more of a, uh, it's it, like, for example, vaginal delivered babies uh, with a baby moving from one direction to another in a very uh, in a in a high speed, uh, soccer ball, baseball, and also a, a baby falling from a table from a, 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 a from a, a just from unidirectionally. Also, uh, actually, I've been uh, uh, like when I was in court as a as an expert witness. Uh, you know, people are asking, can a vibration from a, a from riding a car, like from moving back and forth, can that result in a um, uh, retinal hemorrhage that's similar to abusive head trauma. And that was actually the, the reason I started this whole study. But the translational injury uh, that I was demonstrating here with the soccer ball is just basically a, is a, uh, is a translate, is a, is a similar to the other situations that I, dem that I just shared with you, uh, but in a greater magnitude. Yeah. Um... Would you hypothesize um, something about what the OCT findings might look like uh, in a soccer or a football injury like that? Uh, good question. Uh, thank you very much for uh, asking that. Uh, so as that force is transmitted from anterior to posterior, so that force is, uh, there's an initial compressive force, and then there's a secondary tractional force so there's like it's there's almost like it creates a vacuum the negative pressure right here so there's actually a, almost like a traction or pulling force so with the OCT what I suspect uh, is that uh, you would see a higher incidence of a, for example like a macular hole or retinoschisis uh, 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 retinal schesis with the traction of the, the of the pulling of the um, the retina at the posterior pole, and most of the damages will be localized. Clinically, what we will see is that most of the damages will be localized to the posterior pole. Great, thanks. Um, any of my colleagues want to pose, Mohammed? Uh, Donny, thank you very, very much for this great work. This really takes us way into the future. My question to you is what's next? Uh, a publication, uh, you know, some more specific research to, to go forward? Because as you know, most of the literature that the defense lawyers come with is, is based on animals and not on human beings and simulation like yours. So what's next with you? Thank you. Um, so two things. Uh, so we, we actually have uh, completed the animal experiment on lambs and monkeys. And this publication, we submitted it for publication and we're waiting for the uh, reply. And uh, it was actually submitted to Injury. Injury. It's actually one of the major uh, uh, journals in uh, uh, and uh, to document various types of injury. So, uh, so we're waiting for the, the response from that. And second is that uh, this, pub this actually, the finite element experiment has already been published in American Journal of Ophthalmology in AJO. And the, uh, and the soccer ball injury, we just completed it. And we're, pl we're hoping to, uh, we're actually gonna submit it to uh, JPOS. Great. So, but there are more, there are a lot more studies coming. Uh, thanks, Dr. Saw, for, for your comments this morning and safe travels to you, please. Um, so Thank we're you. going to move to our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Eric Bothan, who is Professor of Ophthalmology at the Mayo Clinic uh, in Minnesota. So um, Eric, take it away. Your slides are up. Hear my slides, okay. Yep. All right, well, I appreciate the opportunity to be involved in, in this group and to share a little bit about strabismus in, in the setting of lens anomalies. Um, I have a particular interest in this subject in light of some uh, a role I've played with the infant aphakia treatment study, and I'll touch on that as I go forward. Um, all right, and I have no financial interest to disclose. 
pediatric lens anomalies and their care have um, been an area of interest of mine in a variety of research endeavors. And I think we all are well aware that the sequela in a child from having a pediatric cataract um, it, it can be numerous. And some of these are related potentially to the surgical endeavors performed or uh, elevated risk as a result of early surgery. And others have to do with refractive status or um, the impact on binocularity. So I, I titled this talk, Post Phacic Strabismus. It's meant to discuss the strabismus that we see after children have had their lens operated on. So either aphakes or pseudophakes. Strabismus is common, we know this, we see this. For those of us that care for children with lens anomalies, it becomes just like amblyopia and refractive management. It becomes a, a meaningful part of our care for these children years and decades after the original lens was managed. And studies have shown over time, both historical and more recently, um, that unilateral cataracts are more disruptive than bilateral cataracts on the development of strabismus. And I think we rationalize that in terms of the similar to uh, this, the damage in the amblyopia and the vision in terms of the inequalities between the two eye and the, and the disruption in terms of binocular development. There are some reports over time that have, have speculated that an intraocular lens was in some way protective for the development of strabismus. Um, and yet, just like glaucoma, it appears that so the reason these early series might have looked that way is just due to selection bias. Lenses, the older children and easier, simpler eyes got lenses and the more complicated eyes were left aphakic. So it looked like lenses were um, a part of the improvement. But with randomization, that has not been identified. And then for uh, an effort I've been involved with and many others, um, the infant aphakia treatment study was uh, has been well published uh, over many years and uh, as a randomized study in infant cataract surgery and randomized to IOLs versus contact lenses. Uh, in the last year, the 10-year results were released um, on uh, various aspects of these children at age 10.5 years. The first, as you see here, uh, Dr. Lambert led the way in, in um, describing the vision results. Definitely, we can have um, excellent outcomes at uni after unilateral cataract surgery, but also we have a long way to go because of the dense amblyopia. There are many, many children that still see poorly despite refractive management appropriately and patching. And now there's subpapers. Um, the glaucoma adverse events um, were summarized at a year and at five years. And now this uh, was just recently uh, um, came out in the literature uh, and it did not make a difference whether you were pseudophagic or aphagic, or these children were. Uh, glaucoma and glaucoma suspect uh, rates continue to climb um, through 10 years, and obviously that will likely continue as they get older. And there are a variety of other subpapers that are coming out. I have had the opportunity of helping lead the strabismus effort in the infant aphagic treatment study. Uh, these are two articles that were published at their five years of age, and now they're at 10. Um, I just want to touch on what we learned over time in this group. Strabismus at baseline, about a, a quarter of kids at the time of cataract surgery as an infant were described to having strabismus. And a number of them had a small exo as commonly seen in infants in the first months of life. Um, it didn't matter whether uh, in either group, whether they were the AFICA group or the IOL group, but it did seem to be suggestive that the earlier you got after their cataract, um, the less likely they had strabismus at baseline. And then irrespective of our management, pseudophagic or aphagic, you can see here on the graph at the bottom over the first year of life, progressively, despite our efforts to improve vision and patching and refraction, more and more and more children developed strabismus. So about 70% of children at a year of life had strabismus. The pattern early on looked esotropic. File that away because this is important for a takeaway at the end. Then at five years, we reported that fewer and fewer children remained purely orthophoric, meaning no strabismus at distance and near. Surgery for strabismus started to happen more and more commonly, 15% by a first year of life, 40% by age five, as uh, this, these unilateral post phacic um, strabismus uh, are become more and more of a concern. 
I, one of the papers written was on their uh, the, the strabismus surgery outcomes. And as you see here, the vast majority were for esotropic. Now I need to stop here and say, in studies like this, this is a subgroup of a bigger study that's meant to study vision. Strabismus management, the indication on when to strew strabismus and how much to do when you did it in techniques were not part of the protocol. So this is based on investigator discretion and family choice. But fit 62% of the pit children at this point had had surgery for esotropia, dominant dominated picture. And disappointingly, at age five, only a third of them would have had a strabismus result that we're truly happy with less than 10 prism diopters. It does look like the kids that are purely orthophoric drive the successful alignment group compared to all the, the ones that have poor vision and uh, typically do more. So now, Finally, literally in the last months, we're finally getting the data on the strabismus outcomes at age 10. So of the 114 kids enrolled, uh, we got 110 of them back to do strabismus measurements on 109, equal between the two groups. Um, and as not a surprise, the kids with the best vision typically have the best alignment. Um, that was not, I will comment there that in the, in the earlier subgroup about the surgeries, we did not find that the group that had surgery had better vision. So it does not appear that realigning them or there wasn't evidence helped their vision journey. But if they started out and had a, an improved vision outcome early on, they had better strabismus. At age 10 now, it went from 70% at a year 80% at five years, now we're only almost at 90% of kids have some level of strabismus by age 10. The majority of which have the same deviation at distance and near, not a surprise. Equal numbers, whether you had a lens place, an IOL primarily, or contact lenses. And equal frequency, if you look at orthophoria and a little bit of microtropia. The lens choice, your aphakic choice, did not affect alignment outcomes. And if you were straight at age five, you had a better chance of being straight at age 10. Surgery had been performed. You see here about 50% of kids um, had surgery, equal groups between the two treatment. Um, and it's disappointingly at age 10, irrespective of surgery, only about a third were, had a deviation less than 10 prism diopters. What was striking at age 10 is now 50% of our cohort were exotropic. So it started out that we had 50, or that the, twice as many kids were esotropic. Now at age 10, twice as many kids as esos are exos. So it flipped. And obviously you can suspect that a good number of these are consecutive exotropias. But also at a year of age, we had about 2% of kids that had hypers. And now it's 40%. 17% are, are pure and, and another 33% associated, actually it's 50%, I'm a typo there, um, with, with strabismus. Stereopsis is poor, not a surprise. No child with strabismus surgery, if they got to strabismus surgery, ever retained anything more than gross stereopsis. And visual acuity, if you had great vision all along, you did better on alignment. So what's the takeaway? Strabismus is common after pediatric lens management and the lens choice did not affect outcomes. Esotropia is common early and exotropia, including consecutives, but even without um, strabismus surgery, children that were esotropic early tended to, so many of them shifted exo later and hypertropias developed. So surgical success um, was guarded um, even with, uh, with, uh, with appropriate surgery along the way. So my takeaways I'd say is I mean, include strabismus actively in your consent and education and be patient. The exo shift was present in some children and surprised us. Um, certainly you might consider waiting because I don't think there's any evidence by this randomized control study that early surgery for strabismus affected the outcomes. Um, so I've shifted a little bit with these kids. If it doesn't help my vision outcomes, I've now waited a little bit and let them get closer to visually or socially impactful age groups like school age. And later surgery also helps us address if there's a vertical that might develop. Certainly if an examiner anesthesia or another procedure is being performed, well then maybe it could be addressed. Um, uh, at that time, but have hesitation a little bit, or I do, for a two-year-old resedating them at that age just to make the alignment look better. Um, and be prepared for reoperations. Other takeaways: be conservative. 
be conservative with esotropic corrections early on, as we are in other forms of esotropic patterns. Um, you consider just being conservative and doing one muscle instead of both, as long as we're a little worried about consecutive shift and consider tying it in with other surgeries rather than recent multiple sedations for surgery over time. And unstudied here is just consider Botox, which some consider to be a conservative option um, in this group. As I have two minutes, I just want to take away, one of the things I've taken away in these kids is um, just different approaches to try to be conservative with strabismus. And this, was a, this is not part of the Infinite Faca treatment study, but Dr. Tico um, wrote up uh, about combining strabismus with len other lens approaches. And so for me, instead of doing multiple surgeries over time, sometimes I take a kid like this, who's a two and a half year old, right AFAC, and they want a secondary lens inserted for failed contact lenses. And I'll put on my loops and maybe start with the strabismus and then transition and put an intraocular lens in. And to me, it's a way of avoiding multiple anesthesias, two separate anesthesias. And my caution here is as we do these sort of things, being try to help the strabismus, but try not to be heroic with the strabismus, I just be careful because doing these sort of things can make post-operative examinations very difficult when we really need to be careful for um, evaluating endophthalmitis. So it could be, be prepared for that. And if you endeavor in some of these things, my tip would be um, it does work but certainly start with strabismus first and consider fornix approaches. I always typically do one muscle instead of two in this setting. Um, so at least a quiet quadrant to look at the other anterior segment of care I might've done um, and just monitor to be careful for these kids. And I wanna thank the, the group of people that have helped with the strabismus evaluations in the infinite fake treatment study and uh, for your patience in listening to this talk. Um, so Eric, thanks very, very much for those um, comments. They're certainly good. Uh, just for the audience's um, knowledge, we are going to take questions for each of the three speakers. Um, it, if you have them now and they get posted, I'll take them, but we'll take them at the end of the next three talks as well. Uh, but before Eric goes, I was going to say, gee, I would have thought you've now seen the light and realized that too early strabismus surgery and unilateral aphakia is bad. But tell me about what you know in bilateral aphakia because I know you've done some work there as well. Uh, and if there is a different approach, you think, in those patients compared to the unilateral aphakic patients that were the IATS cohort. And when you say different approach to the strabismus? Well, do you, do, you, do you find that they follow the same thing, that they go exotropic as well? Um, I always think of them not having the same shift as the unilaterals do. Correct, and I, I would share that. So um, recently we've reported the TAPS registry looking at different age groups, the age group just older than infinite FACA treatment study. And in TAPS, we looked at the bilaterals um, age zero to seven months and then seven to 24 months. Interestingly, that the lower rate of strabismus um, wasn't as dominant in that group. I mean, you look at the about 40% of kids in the TAPS one, zero to seven months had strabismus and a similar rate seven months to 24 months, um, higher rates of nystagmus in the younger group, but not as much strabismus. And so the, the comment of did is does the strabismus shift less exo? It's my personal experience that way. And yet I can't say that the literature that I can report on that um, at, at, in the same degree, because specifically looking at the consecutive rate, that would have to be analyzed and that hasn't been done in TAPS. It, it was yeah. also just in the APOS meeting uh, in the last weekend, um, there was a storm registry. Dr. Wilson looked at two years to seven years and his rate of strabismus, even in the bilaterals was much lower, or is my understanding and communicating with him. So what happens there too, is you're developing a different cohort. They're acquired, their cataracts are acquired later. They develop better binocularity earlier. So even if they develop strabismus, I think some, it's a different cohort and I think different strabismus outcomes. So perhaps different recommendations. Uh, sure. Mohammed has a question or at least had his hand up, but you'll need to unmute. Yes, uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you very much for this beautiful presentation and summary. Uh, my question was about uh, acquired nystagmus. I mean, you have a unilateral cataract, you start patching the good eye and on follow up, the patient comes or the, patient, the family would call and say, the, the eyes are shaking. 
uh, as you know, Halveston raised this issue years ago, and ultimately we figured out that this is this is really not due to our treat, uh, our management and the patching. It is part of the nature of the beast. So, can you comment about this, either from your personal experience or the uh, IATS? Yeah, I in that um, nystagmus evaluations have been part of the infant FA treatment study outcomes, and those are emerging, you know, as the tenure data comes along now. I think what you're, you know, certainly there's a latent component to these unilateral um, nystagmus cases where you, you know, you're covering the good eye, and then late nystagmus um, becomes manifest either under patch or becomes manifest as there's asymmetric vision and they have a nystagmus um, in uh, binocularly. Um, certainly to me, it doesn't affect my patching management or amblyopia care. There are rare cases where I've, in my opinion, that, that parents will notice some, uh, they notice that in uh, higher levels of nystagmus during your care, like patching, but I haven't, um, I don't change management in terms of my vision goals and, or my, my, well, my education to parents, you know, the first and foremost goal is you get, we're getting the vision better in that spare tire in that weaker eye and the better the vision, the better our outcomes in terms of motor control. But do you have experiences or, or comment on, on change and how, what you, how you communicate to families or sh change your management in that setting? Uh, I, I don't change the patching regimen, but I can tell you for sure that it does scare me every time that happens. So I look at this every time that I see the patient just to make sure that the optic nerve on both sides is still fine. And of course, sure. make sure that the patient doesn't have any neurologic symptoms. Uh, it does happen. It does happen, yeah. but I don't change the MVOP treatment. Yeah. So um, Eric, thanks very much. I think that this idea of delaying surgery and being way more conservative uh, is really important with the unilateral aphakic group. And I think you've certainly highlighted that with data. Um, I think that given the time, we'll move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Professor Mohammed Jafar, who's the Weinstein Professor and Chief Emeritus at the Children's National Hospital in Washington and the Professor of Ophthalmology at uh, George Washington University. Uh, and he's going to try and get this to work properly. So Mohammed, you're on. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, and thank you again for the organizers for the invitation. Um, greetings from Washington. I'm going to cover uh, two aspects of superior oblique palsy. Uh, hey, Mohammed, the um, audio is not going to come through this way. Uh, are you hearing anything at all from me? Uh, not, not from the slide deck, only from your, your live voice. So we, we hear it in the background only. So you'll have yeah, to do we, it live. Okay, I definitely will do that. Sorry for this. And I am going back no again and let's see if I can do anything here. Give me a second, sorry. Yeah. To the audience, if you're thinking about questions, certainly yeah. feel free to put them in the Q&A. Can you see my slide right now? Not yet, uh, not yet. Not yet, okay. Sorry for this. I, no, uh, it, it's, okay. it's okay. If you do it just from the PowerPoint, it'll be okay. It'll just, we'll do it from the, without running the slideshow, just run it from the PowerPoint okay. edit program. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have no conflict of interest to disclose. Um, I'm going to cover two aspects of uh, superior oblique palsy. Uh, we all uh, know this. Mohammed, you'll, you're, you'll uh, need to find the right share screen. Uh, I know we had this all working perfectly before. I don't know why it's not working. There we go. Uh, uh, oh. there, it's come up now. Okay. So let me start again. I do apologize for this technical issue. Uh, so again, uh, our audience knows uh, how to diagnose superior oblique palsy. We measure the deviation in primary position uh, at distance and near, as well as uh, we uh, uh, check the nine cardinal positions of gaze. We add the three-step test of Parks, double Maddox rod test, as well as fundus examination looking for X-cyclotorsion. 
I've been interested in bilateral superior oblique palsy since Kushner uh, published his paper in 1988 on the diagnosis and treatment of bilateral mask superior oblique palsy. Uh, classically, superior oblique palsy uh, has minimal hypertropia in primary position, a V pattern with an isotropia in down gaze, uh, left hypertropia in right gaze, uh, right hypertropia left gaze, a Bilshovsky head tilt test that is positive with tilting both to the right and left shoulders. And double Maddox rod test usually shows more than 10 degrees of X cyclotorsion, either between the two eyes or uh, uh, additionally. Fundus examination shows X cyclotorsion bilaterally. Kushner emphasized that almost mass bilateral superior uh, oblique palsy uh, patients have a chin down patient uh, posture instead of a head tilt, a small hypertropia in primary position increasing abduction, and any hypertropia of the contralateral eye in any gaze is important. This is why he emphasized that assessing the oblique fields of gaze is essential. Bilateral excyclotorsion, be it objectively seen by fundus examination or subjectively with double matter rod is important. And we can see down here that his uh, patient population age group was older, ranging between 16 and 57 years of age. This is from his article. We see that case number one has a right superior oblique palsy with a right hypertropia in all gazes except up and to the left, where it changes to uh, up and to the right, changing to a left hypertropia. Case two, a right hyperphoria that changes in down and to the right to a left hyperphoria. And case three, where it flips to a right hyperphoria in up and to the left. Uh, please pay attention to this the Bilshovsky head tilt test here in case two, where the difference between the right head tilt of right hypertropia and left tilt of uh, orthophoria is really minimal very different from what we usually see in congenital cases where the difference between a right head tilt of 16 in this case and orthophoria and to the left tilt. Last but not least, uh, look and see the X cyclotorsions. In page, case number one, we had eight and five degrees of X cyclotorsion, uh, similar in patients number two, eight and eight. And in patient number three, the subjective cyclotorsion was only seven degrees. However, by fundus examination, the patient had bilateral X cyclotorsion. I was interested in reviewing our Washington experience. So we retrospectively looked at the incidence and pathophysiology of contralateral inferior oblique overaction after surgery for unilateral superior oblique palsy. We reviewed 102 unilateral cases and looked at the age at onset and presentation, the congenital versus traumatic, the anomalous head posture, hypertropia and prime position, the nine cardinal position of gaze whenever this was recorded. Wilshowski had to test S cytotorgen, both objective and subjective, the type of surgery as well as the time of onset of the contralateral paresis. We, this, in this slide, we show that our demographics show that the patients were significantly younger than Kushner's. Uh, median was five for the total group, three for the mask, bilateral, and six years for the unilateral cases. This slide shows that uh, traditionally in bilateral cases, two thirds of the patients have in the patient that turns to be masked, 21% have straight head posture. Uh, but we can see that the range is very large, so it's not very productive, predictive. Uh, when there is a head tilt, the masked patient had less of a tilt than the unilateral cases. Another busy slide just to show that, uh, again, in retrospect, Patients who turned out to be masked have five degrees of hypertropia and positive position compared to the unilateral where it was 10. Uh, when the uh, Bilshkovsky test was uh, compared between the mask and the unilateral, we see that those patients had a smaller deviation. 
Um, and last but not least, the masks were statistically having more bilateral excyclotorsion than the unilateral. A very important slide in here to show that the majority of the cases were congenital, be it masked or not. Specifically, that 90% of the patients with mask superior oblique palsy were congenital and not traumatic. Uh, so, in brief, the contralateral inferior oblique overaction after surgery for unilateral superior oblique palsy is a real entity. It occurred in 28% of our cases. It usually occurs early, within weeks, and rarely it's in, in a, a year up to five. It is equally seen in patients after inferior oblique myectomy or recession, and it's more common in congenital than traumatic cases. Our experience is very similar to that from Hopkins, where Ellis Stein and Guyton in 1998 published their retrospective uh, review of 108 patients. 28% of their patients develop uh, contralateral uh, superior oblique palsy. Uh, they looked at multiple variants. Both groups showed no significant differences in the age of surgery, etiology, average after deviation in primary gaze, ipsilateral and contralateral gazes, ipsilateral and contralateral head tilt, average V pattern, inferior and superior oblique muscle function, excyclotorsion by, by double mantle throughout of endoscopy. So essentially, they compared very well between the two groups. Their average age at time of surgery was much older than our series, around 32 years. The median time interval between surgery and diagnosis of contralateral superior oblique palsy between quotation is two months. The range was two weeks to five years. 83% of the cases occurred within the first four months. Of the 30 patients uh, that turned out to be bilateral, six were traumatic and 24 congenital, again, a one to five ratio. Traumatic cases showed no statistical likelihood to develop contralateral superior oblique paresis after surgery. 10 patients had one or more Kushner proposed signs of a bilateral superior oblique muscle paresis before surgery. However, only two of these 10 had signs of an apparent contralateral superior oblique muscle paresis developed after surgery. So the conclusion was that surgical overcorrection of a unilateral superior oblique muscle paresis can masquerade as an apparent contralateral superior oblique muscle paresis. This is caused by a persistence of the head tilt and side gaze misalignment pattern from the original superior oblique muscle paresis. Contralateral superior oblique muscle paresis happens uh, its incidence ranges between 9% in Kushner's series to up to 28% in guidance and our series. The onset is early, within weeks, and possibly delayed up to a few years. It is equally seen after a few oblique myectomy or recession and is more common in congenital than traumatic cases, probably because, because we have detected all the bilateral cases in the traumatic. So beware and forewarn that contralateral inferior oblique overaction after surgery for unilateral superior oblique palsy can happen. You have one out of four chances. So let the family and patients know that. Now I'm going to move to another issue, which is management of what I call compound tropia. Patients with superior oblique palsy sometimes present with horizontal and vertical deviation, along with excyclotorsion. Short of having a synoptophore, which will predict the postoperative uh, fusion potential, um, I use a simple test that we all know about, but I think is underutilized. Uh, we know that double Maddox rod is quite a dissociating test, so it is hard to predict if the patient will be able to fuse postoperatively uh, or Torsion. However, testing for cyclotorsion with the less dissociating Bagolini lenses may help determine the patient's ability to cyclofuse once the vertical and or horizontal deviation is corrected with prisms. The patient wears the Bagolini lenses with the uh, striations on a vertical alignment, and this way the patient will see a horizontal line when, when uh, they are 
having all their environment uh, uh, around to help them fuse. We put prisms in front of the eyes to correct the horizontal and vertical deviation. And here we start with frame number one, where the patient has a horizontal, vertical, and cyclotorsion. Uh, in frame number two, the patient was able to fuse once the prisms were placed to control the horizontal and vertical deviation. However, in frame three, even though the horizontal and vertical deviations were corrected, the patient still suffers from cyclotorsion and will need help for that. I thank you for your attention. Mohammed, thanks very much for that, and sorry about the, the, the audio break up there for a moment. Uh, so if you could click I out. I apologize for the double. Right. So I have a question. Um, obviously, the difference between the Hopkins uh, study and the children's or Washington experience may be the site uh, that is um, the, that you're primarily at a children's hospital, and Dr. Guyton and his team are at, um, at, at you know an eye department. If, if you think that that's probably just sight rather than a true difference between our two cities. Uh, I, I think we both share the same uh, Northeast location. Uh, the, the real thing that I really could not uh, figure out, even though the age difference between our series and, and uh, Wilmer's uh, have shown the same incidence, but I cannot really explain why the incidence is so different from Kushner's, which was around 9%. Uh, that's really different. Push and, and the guidance uh, where the ages were essentially the same. So I, I really cannot explain it. Okay. And what do you think is the best clue the non strabismus expert should look for for this masked bilateral? Uh, we really could not find any, any clue. Uh, and obviously, we at Kaftalmoy's know how to detect bilateral cases ahead of time. And this is why, you know, we, we, we just ruled them out completely or almost completely. So I don't think there was any uh, low-lying bilateral that we missed. I think it is the nature of the beast. It is possibly an uh, overcorrection as um, Dave Guyton and his group demonstrated, or possibly it's a mechanical issue. But against mechanical issue is that both myectomy as well as recession didn't really show any difference. I would have guessed that a well-done myectomy without scarring uh, versus a recession where the muscle is still attached to the globe, we, we should have seen more with the recession than with the myectomy, but it did not pan out to be the, the, the cause. And there were no transposition of the... Right. Okay. Mike, do you and have an hour? Do you want to save questions for later? Um, so why don't you ask now, Eric, since it, okay. it would be fine. Okay. So I had two questions. Um, one had to do with the testing, but just in the comment you just made, um, has it changed your surgical management? Do you think you operate on two muscles less frequently than one um, for larger, remember that 15 to 25 or uh, in terms of the, your, your findings? Uh, I can't answer your question specifically, but I can tell you that I usually operate on one. What it has really family is I tell them that, you know, there is a one out of four chances that the same phenomenon shows on the other side. And my treatment has been the same. So if the, the first eye had an inferior oblique myectomy, uh, the second eye, when it happens, it will be the same thing, an inferior oblique myectomy. So even though it is truly not a superior oblique palsy on the other side, or may not be, the, the management is still the same, weakening an overactive muscle or strengthening an underactive muscle. But definitely it is my consent uh, form right now. And then the other thing is, is your interest in the, the subjective um, awareness of, of, of torsion on double Maddox rod. It's striking how many patients have a unilateral, more classic picture, and maybe it's not because it's a bilateral hidden, unmasked, but have um, their experience of torsion in their unaffected, um, non palsy eye and or even torsion on fundus torsion, the, the visible appearance of torsion is more prominent in the non palsy eye. The, any, is there any aspect to, for when you do your double Maddox rod testing, either subjectively or more formally by structure, 
do you, do you do you pause differently? Do you approach it differently when their report or your view of torsion is different um, than what the overall exam would say in, sure, in terms of laterality um, and and or in terms of of um, discrepancies between the two eyes? Uh, the quick answer is no. The only thing, I mean, traditionally we were taught to always put the red filter over the right eye and the white filter, uh, Maddox rod over the left. I have, when I am a little bit in doubt and the patient is really not aware of what's going on, I have been putting the red filter over the non dominant eye and the white Maddox rod over the uh, dominant eye. I think this will make them more aware of the two, two lines. Uh, and a nice anecdote, I was examining a 70-year-old lady, and I tell them, tell me if the two lines are parallel to each other, meaning they are the same uh, uh, level as the uh, the floor, and the, or one of that is tilted. So are they parallel or not? And the lady had a big smile on her, said, Dr. Jafar, I've been teaching math for 50 years. There you go. So parallel. You, was you test monocularly something. before binocularly with double Maddox rods? I do not. I do not. Yeah. All right. I, I thank, thank you. All right, so, so great. Um, we will, I think, um, in the interest of the organizer's schedule, move to my talk. So I get to see if I can get this up here. So that should be, Eric, if you would just signal that that's up. Yep. All right, so, so I am professor of ophthalmology at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, just up the street from Dr. Jafar. Uh, by about 50K. All right, so let's move. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about binocular treatment of amblyopia today. Um, I am served as a medical monitor for Illuminopia 1 and have no equity interest, but we'll mention that. And I do receive some salary support from the Academy of Ophthalmology and the National Institute. One of the things that has been interesting in our field in the last 10 years has been the acknowledgement that amblyopia is binocular. Uh, first it was, well, there are simply deficits in the sound or fellow eye um, at the cortical level, and maybe treatment ought to be uh, involved differently. Uh, and we've traditionally, of course, used a patch or atropine, which are all monocular treatments. And so there's been a great deal of interest in some ways, interest that far exceeds the data. So, so said another way, computer games with binocular stimulation are certainly of a great deal of interest at the moment in our field. Um, there are a number of case series that have shown modest improvement, even in adults who you would say or have thought based upon previous data, we're not gonna get better. Um, typically, these activities are not generally available outside of research, although there is some marketing, at least in the United States, where parents could get a program and have their child do that program. So one of the earliest of these um, from uh, McGill University was to take the now somewhat ancient uh, binocular or Tetris game and create a binocular version of it in which some colored dots were seen with the fellow eye, some with the amblyopic eye and some with both eyes. And you could set it, as you see in the pictures to the right, adjust for a small amount of strabismus. And you would play this game uh, every day for about 30 minutes. Um, and that sounded really exciting to the children when it was first mentioned. But then you think about playing Tetris in 2021 or 2019 uh, with most sophisticated children who have seen a handheld computer, uh, it's not going to last long. Nonetheless, it was the idea was to take that and study it. And so our PETA group took that Tetris game and performed a study we called number 18 uh, and did it with two age cohorts, five to less than 13 years of age, 13 to less than 17 years of age. And we took it for all comers from strabismic, anisometropic, amblyopia, or both. But remember that the strabismic patients had to be 
generally five or six prism diopters or less. They could have had surgery. Uh, we treated them for 16 weeks uh, and we did a randomized study. So it's all looking good until this. We randomized them to doing the iPad Tetris game for an hour per day, really long, or patching two hours per day. Um, the first decision made it hard for compliance. The second decision made it hard to see whether there was in fact a beneficial effect or not, because we compared it to patching, not to glasses. And the two trials in the two cohorts are shown in this slide and the subsequent uh, two slides. So first for the children five to less than 13 years of age, um, you can see the visual acuity and the amblyopic eye uh, is represented um, in these box plots. Binocular acuity are the circles and the open box plots or the white box plots and the patching group are the squares and the um, gray box plots. And improving visual acuity is going down. And you can see that the binocular group uh, does get a little bit better um, over time, over the four, eight, 12, and 16 week time points. But the patching group uh, did a little bit better, both as you look at the medians, but you also can see the means uh, in, in the little dots and the whole box plots. So that patching group there did slightly better, although not different. Uh, and for the older children in whom we were really looking for another treatment, remember that our ability to treat this group that comes in, quote, too late, unquote. Um, and here, um, once again, similar data, but the, the children actually um, are showing in the binocular group, again, in the circles and the patching group in the solids, just no difference in the outcome between those two. So if we summarize those outcomes, there was an adjusted difference of 0.31 lines favoring patching in the younger group and an adjusted difference of 2.7 letters in the older group in both cases favoring patching. Now you can look at that, that last line, 13% completed more than 75% of scheduled time. So compliance with this game was miserable. Uh, and in fact, you could argue that we were comparing patching to almost no treatment uh, and patching did get a little bit better. Um, in terms of overall improvement, of course, both of the groups got a little bit better, uh, but not what we would really like to see uh, for the expense that would go on with such a treatment. Well, gaming technology goes forward and Tetris is eclipsed by many other games, both for general use, but also in amblyopia therapy. And here is one done by a company called Ubisoft uh, called Dig Rush. Uh, company that would become Amblyotech and now is part of Novartis. Uh, and in this game, the children would have miners moving around and springs and gold and more interaction, if you will, uh, than watching a falling blocks design. So PDIG did a randomized comparison, this time to glasses alone. And the reason we did that was, so does this technology do anything um, and that was really the fundamental question we didn't ask with the falling blocks. Uh, and the study has been completed. Um, we did it in younger groups. So you can see here two groups, seven to the 12 years of age and four to less than seven years. Uh, the first project was reported a year ago uh, and the second project is submitted. Um, so first, the older children. 138 children, mean age of 9.6 years, uh, spectacles versus spectacles plus one hour of games, but only five days a week. So the results, after four weeks, the mean vision improved a little bit with binocular treatment, 1.3 letters, and 1.7 letters with spectacles. Uh, you do the statistician's adjustment for baseline vision, um, and then you get 
a finding that the patients with patching, sorry, with continued glasses alone actually did slightly better. The analysis was repeated after eight weeks and again, no difference. So this study in this age group failed to show a benefit of binocular therapy. The results for the three to six years of age group are completed. Uh, they are a little controversial and a little bit, um, uh, they don't end up telling the story. Um, I'm not, I cannot share the data because we're still submitting the data and it is not accepted for publication. Um, but there's some hope is what I would say. But technology moves on. Um, you know, a mere computer display doesn't hold hands up to virtual reality headset to, um, displays to provide delivery. One could argue yet more expensive. And there are two versions of this technology that are available in the US, Luminopia 1, which is in clinical trials, and Vivid Vision, which is actually available uh, for patients and parents uh, to do now. Um, they work a little bit differently, uh, but they use the virtual reality headset to present two different images uh, or a different image to, to each eye. So it's not really creating a virtual reality in the sense of some kind of crazy 3D world, but rather just using the dicoptic presentation uh, to do that. Um, Vivid Vision has um, published one paper uh, which is referenced here in 2017, uh, which shows that in 17 adults, there was some improvement uh, with the treatment. They have no publications uh, in children. Uh, Luminopia 1 had no public has no publications, but they have a presentation I could steal a couple slides from last weekend. Uh, David Hunter um, presented the uh, initial report of this uh, and what they do in this gadget is show TV shows and movies, uh, and they basically mask parts of the fellow eyes image. And with that, they are sort of patching. They also reduce contrast uh, to try and get the patients to have some improvement. Uh, and they've licensed a lot of time on the, on the platform. And this is not published yet, uh, but David's results are shown here, which showed at least prior to publication and peer review uh, that Luminopia 1 did provide a benefit of about a line compared to control uh, improvement at 12 weeks. So there was at least evidence now in this age group of children, three to seven, that the binocular uh, input can be beneficial. And I dare say with the future dig rush data, I think there's some hope here uh, for binocular therapy as another treatment option. Um, I, I want to emphasize though, that we don't know that this is the best treatment, um, whether this treatment will be better than patching. Those are all questions that have to be added. And certainly the key question I would ask and have asked is, is there value in this compared to patching when this will cost much more? Um, I wanna to turn to one other study that I had the uh, privilege of uh, performing last year uh, in preparation for a lecture for the Academy. And that was a study of amblyopia in iris registry. And this is about outcomes data in the US. And I won't say that those data are the same around the world, uh, but it can teach us, at least in patients who have access to healthcare, what exactly um, their outcomes are in the real world. And so Iris Registry, of course, is a American Academy of Ophthalmology product now owned by Verona Health uh, and enrolls data from uh, just under 12,000 ophthalmologists uh, with integrated healthcare records, which allow the data to be extracted. And I wanted to show here just the outcomes, um, because I think that we have definitely room to move up. And there is reason for future research and young clinicians to say, how can I do better outcomes? So these are the 
visual acuity outcomes for, for cross-sectional samples of amblyopic children. Um, sorry, these are longitudinal of the children, but cross-sectional across ages, showing their vision at the beginning of their care and at the end of their care over an average of about two and a half years. And the time frame of that care was really set by the age of the registry and how long the patients could be entered. Uh, but you can see that we had, for instance, in the first column, children three to six years of age, 45,000 children. They started with a logmar acuity of 0.41 and they finished with an acuity of 0.23. So we had about a two line improvement um, but as you'll see, that meant that they were still about two and a half lines worse than their um, sound eye or fellow eye. And over the older age range of patients, you can see that the follow-up visual acuity is always 0 0.25, 0 0.31. And then for the 300,000 patients who carry the diagnosis of amblyopia after 18 years of age, they really have significant uh, deficits of almost five and a half lines. This plot, I think, shows us where we are with our treatment effect in children. And I'm trying to emphasize the persistent interocular visual acuity deficit. So these are children who are treated uh, in clinical practice. They have access to health care. Um, and this, the data are, are shown by year of age. Uh, at entry, so from age three to age 17. And if we look at the first set of boxes in your far left, so the 9,943 year olds who had optotype visual acuity, the fellow eye is shown in red or orange and the amblyopic eye in, uh, uh, so the amblyopic eye is shown in turquoise. This is after treatment. So there is a deficit between the two eyes and if you look from left to right, you can see that that deficit is present at all age groups. Nowhere do we collapse the deficit. And so on average, that ranges from 0.8 to 2.4 lines. And again, this is residual after treatment uh, in healthcare in a, you know, a very high cost healthcare system. So, we know we then have persistent deficits that those children go on into life with. And the uh, next thing was, I said, could we apply a measure that we could then compare doctor to doctor? And that's take that group of amblyopic children who have the best chance of success, three to seven years of age, um, they're treated um, by the doctor uh, because of the nature of our um, mandate from our uh, Medicare program, it has to be a three to 12 month year treatment interval uh, for unilateral amblyopia. So again, the best case scenario in any clinical care. And so how did we do? Um, so we measure how did we do by succeeding on any of these three criteria. So collapsing the visual acuity difference to less than or equal to two lines, uh, improvement of three lines, or final visual acuity 20, 30 or better. And again, three criteria for success is the agreed on uh, measure here in our country. So as clinicians, we succeeded with that measure, which I would argue is a generous measure, 77% of the time. So not bad. Uh, if we apply that measure incidentally to older children, uh, we succeed only about 55% of the time. So success is a majority, uh, but not certainly um, the level that I think we think we do or that we would like to do. Uh, if we compare IRIS registry data, which again represents real world clinical care at 77%, and we compare the outcome to ATS-1, which was our prospective trial of patching and atropine drops in which there was a success rate um, of 83%. And Children's Hospital in Boston looked at their uh, application of this measure and found a similar 81%. You would conclude we still are failing 20% of our patients. 
um, in ways that um, we wish weren't true. So again, emphasizing that there is still a deficit in our quality of care. So moving forward, I think that binocular therapy with dicoptic image presentation is a method that needs further exploration, um, but it needs exploration not just in does it work, uh, but does do we get something more than we get with conventional therapy? Uh, and we really need the bioscientists to figure out how to reopen the critical period for vision development. And there are all kinds of clever ideas about adjusting neurotransmitters as had been the hope, for instance, with levodopa, uh, or direct treatment of neuronal DNA, which sounds really interesting. Um, but we also need to improve both our coverage for vision screening, meaning earlier detection in primary care, and at least in our country, improving the coverage of eyeglasses for children with amblyopia or access to those glasses. So in summary, uh, a mean residual deficit of two lines seems to be commonplace, in fact, the norm, both in clinical trials with ideal care and for patients who are seen in real world. Um, and our approaches probably have improved over time, but we do need to continue to improve our care of these children. So thanks very much for your attention uh, this evening. Um, and I think that um, I'd like to open uh, the uh, panel to questions uh, to any of the three of us um, doctors, both in Jafar and Repka for a few minutes uh, before we close the session. Mike, a really very quick uh, comment. You know, the PIDIC studies as well as the IRIS registry are really nice because they are real world uh, figures, as you mentioned, and uh, it's important. Uh, again, you know, we treat the family and not the patient alone. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that there is an around 80% improvement, but uh, as you said, we have to keep pushing. Yeah, so one of the things that um, we can do with those data just um, as another thing, it's great to have the number, but of course, Eric could see that he does better in his population than I do. Uh, and we could look at why that is, um, because it's not just about the doctor. And it's one of the things that we hope to do uh, in IRIS registry, because we have enough patients in PEDIG, We've never seen a, for instance, a ethnicity difference or a um, sex difference in terms of outcomes, even though many of us might have said the young girls would do better. It never turned out that way. Um, great. I think that um, I will take the prerogative since um, the day is long for our colleagues in Delhi. Um, and um, they probably have places to be and things to do um, to uh, think we'll close this session. Uh, thank my European colleagues for tuning in uh, during this um, session as well. And remind the attendees that um, you reconvene tomorrow morning at 9.30 uh, Indian time. Um, and um, have a good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks again to uh, Dr. Subash for the invitation to present this morning, and of course to Drs. Jafar, Bothan, and Saw for helping out um, this week in preparation. Uh, so again, I'll turn this back to the um, convener and to the organizers. Uh, thank you, sir. It was very interesting session, and thank you each one of you for nice uh, talks. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed, and uh, I. Hope the audience also will be benefited by your great talks. And thank you very much uh, for joining us, sir. And take care and stay safe. Uh, let me say, say safe to everyone as well, worldwide. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, sir. Fine. Thank you. Right. thank you so much. That brings us to the end. Uh, in the meanwhile, all of the attendees who are still logged in, we shall be live tomorrow morning, 9.30 a.m., IST, and we hope to see you there as well. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a wonderful evening.